This uh, conference will now be recorded. With the, um, let's see, okay. Uh, we will have the Pledge of Allegiance and then we'll have a moment of silence. So here we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag to the of flag. the United yeah. States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, yes. one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, thank you all. Uh, first item on the agenda will be approval of minutes from the April the 27th meeting. Make a motion to approve. This is Councilman Stein. Okay, second. we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Would the clerk please call roll? I've got Councilmember Stites as that motion, and then Councilmember Kahar. I'll I'll put you down as the second if that's all right. Very good. Kahar. Yes. Malat? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Stites? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. The next item is this statement of the bill paid in the amount of 132,150.14. Make a motion to pay the bills in the amount of $132,140.50.14. Second. We have motion and a second to approve the statement of the bills played. Would the clerk please call roll? Sorry, everyone. I was I'm on the horn with Councilmember Adams trying to get him looped in his email address. <laughs> yeah, you're, um, you're fine. That's okay. That, I missed that motion and second. Can somebody help me out? Uh, it's See, Malat made the motion, and was it Margaret that seconded it? Yes, that's correct. Okay, very good. Thank you. Kahar? Yes. Malat? Yes. Driver? Yes. Stites? Yes. Okay, motion carried. And now, um, Zach, here is the, the uh, opportunity for requests or comments, if you have any. I do have one that's been sent in. If you will just bear with me for one moment, I'm trying to get Council Member Adams looped in. Okay, we, we will wait until we get to go ahead from you then. Thank just you. Give me, a couple, give me a couple seconds. I'm gonna put myself on mute. Sure, no problem. Uh 
All right, I've resent that to Councilmember Adams, so hopefully he's able to hop on. If he doesn't, I will try and get him looped back on uh, during the next presentation. But uh, for comments to Council, uh, we received one email request uh, from Connie Henry at 1123 South 102nd Terrace. Uh, Ms. Henry writes, I watched the video of the April 27th council meeting and read the minutes with great interest. I would like to add a note of clarification regarding the cemetery. The fire, part, the, the fire department did not burn the brush pile in the cemetery until Saturday, May 2nd, after I raised concerns about the conditions of the cemetery. Since that meeting, I've seen Mike with Public Works, referring to Mike Odell, or Public Works uh, maintenance worker, to clean up the planters and start the annual pruning and trimming. Good job, Mike. I would also like to thank Gus and Samantha from the fire department for burning the brush pile and picking up the limbs that the mowers left piled up. I would like to hear from Mr. Webb regarding the research he has conducted concerning leaf removal in the cemetery. A ditch running along the east fence line has three years worth of leaves piled up from the pavilion to the south fence. When will those leaves be removed? This matter needs to be addressed promptly. I know that the CPPS board will meet this week, but it's the city's responsibility to see that the necessary work is completed in a timely manner. And just to follow up a little bit on that, we do have leaf removal scheduled for this week for both our, our contractors to go and, and tackle the east fence. And then for, we'll be working to schedule our public works folk as well to get the leaves in the ditch section along 104th, and then that other section of the, the south end section that Ms. Henry described. So, we do continue to work on that, and we are, um, we'll get the cemetery in pretty good shape for, for Memorial Day. And I do appreciate Ms. Henry providing some information about the vegetation that's out there, and, and it'll be helpful, especially in the short-term maintenance of it, and in the long-term as well, as we start to put together a, a more comprehensive maintenance plan, maintenance plan for the site. But that is all the comments that were offered um, for this meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we will move on to the next item on the agenda. We consider recommendation of approval from the Planning Commission regarding special use permit for ex excavating a material extraction from at 9920 Call Drive and adopting resolution 202003 finalizing the same. Dave, you're up. This is Council Dave Nopic, City Planner with the City of Edwardsville. Um, as the mayor mentioned, this is a special use permit renewal at 9920 Cod Drive. Uh, the applicant filed their renewal application with a concept plan and, on February 20th of 2020. The property is approximately 9.6 acres of land and it is zone C2. The actual excavation and material extraction activity has been going on there for um, a couple of years now. It had been previously approved through a, a previous special use permit 2018 04 SUP. Um, at that time, their SUP was set to expire within two years, and therefore the applicant is uh, in the renewal process currently. Uh, it should be noted that this is one of those uh, properties that, with the material extraction, the applicant was required to file a concept plan for how development may occur on the property in the future. Essentially, the extraction activity uh, and the removal of material helps to flatten the land to make it more developable. Um, and therefore, that's why we request that um, the applicants provide at least a concept. The applicant is not responsible for developing the property to those commercial levels or to the level shown in the concept plan. They just need to show that the grades will be left in a manner and that the site has the development potential uh, to it. So this special use permit, again, is a renewal of the extraction activity. They have filed the appropriate plans, including the conceptual plans uh, indicating how future development could occur on the property. On April 15th of 2020, the Planning Commission held the public hearing in regard to this item. The staff and the applicant were the only people that spoke on the item. It was an online public hearing similar to this meeting. Um, and the Planning Commission recommended approval of the special use permit uh, renewal with conditions that are listed in the attached uh, and referenced resolution. Uh, the staff concurs with the recommendation of the Planning Commission. I'm just going to take a second here. The resolution is part of your packet. Um, but I wanted to note in that, that one of the changes that was made in the resolution um, after discussion with the Planning Commission 
uh, was to allow in condition number eight that the hours of operation could be from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Um, I might otherwise the other um, conditions remain the same as those that are on the current SUP other than noting that they need to get us updated documents as they go through their KDHE approvals and extensions and things like that. Um, I'll just note we have not had any complaints regarding noise or trucking activity on the site. Um, there were two incidences involving traffic issues at the uh, temporary construction entrance to this site having to do um, with events after heavy rainfalls and um, mud getting onto K32. Um, in both those cases, the applicant was responsive to getting to getting the roadway cleaned up, but they also then made improvements to the, um, the actual dri drive entrance that is there. And we have had no issues since those two incidents. So with that, I'll conclude my comments and stand ready for any questions on this. Um, Zach, I don't know if the applicant has joined us in case there's questions for the applicant or not. I don't believe the applicant has joined us. Dave, did we have, this is Chuck, did we have a, um, that they had to tear a building down or do something on that previously? Yeah, there was a building that had to be removed in the, I believe it was the southwest corner of the property and that, that building was removed. Okay, is there any excavation right now? There has been excavation on the property. They have not uh, hit the full limits of what their permits allowed and what they paid for as far as material extraction. Um, when they initially filed this SUP, there was a calculation based on their, um, their permit drawings that they submitted. Um, and they paid a fee to a maximum material extraction level. They have not extracted all of those activity, all those materials over the past two years. Um, and they do have projects coming up. So they're anticipating, I think, that they'll have this site closed within the next couple of years. Okay, thank you. Yeah, are there any other questions? Um, I noticed, on, sorry. Um, I noticed on there that it said they had to um, have a sign that um, announced there'd be trucks entering and exiting. Has that been installed yet? Should have been, Michael, do you, I have not been out in the field lately, so I can't verify that. Well, I think that they actually put, those are temporary signs that they put up when they're actually doing excavation services. That's what they've done in the past. They'll, they'll place the appropriate signs of trucks entering and exiting or entering the roadway when they're actually having work and trucks coming and going from the site. That's what they've done in the past versus a, a permanent sign. Oh, okay, thank you. Which I think is better because if they're not there, then there's no need to alert the uh, the, the uh, people coming on the highway. So, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, have they turned in all the other permits that are necessary for this? Yes, all their other material is there. They'll have to provide us some updates regarding their SWIP and also their KDHE uh, permits because they don't all course you know correspond with this date. So as those kind of go off, they have to get us the new and uh, official ones that are appropriated for them. I would just add that, so one of the things we do from a staff standpoint is about every two weeks, uh, our, our code, code officer, I'll use that broadly, uh, or the public works director has, goes on sites where we have open sites. Plans. So if there's some construction being done, uh, that they will go on site and just review it. We don't we don't do the inspections, but we basically look for if it you know if the silt fence is down, if there's mud out there, right. things, then we notify uh, the applicant that those are not in place. They also submit to us uh, this particular one electronically. Every time their inspector goes on site, they submit their inspection report to the city and we maintain those. And so it will show, you know, say there's a part of the fence that needs to be replaced 
or or something of that nature. It'll be noted on the report, and then they have a certain number of days to make corrections to those types of items. If it's something, uh, you know, of, of serious nature, then we will contact them immediately to to get those corrected. And and the two situations we had were heavy rains where quite a bit of material got on the road and uh, they were there within an hour, I would say, of being notified uh, with the appropriate equipment to start cleaning it up. So they, they have been responsive when we've had issues. If there are no further questions, uh, the chair would entertain a motion to approve. Hey, this is uh, Councilman Seitz. Uh, Mike, I, I've got a question for you. So during those two events where there was significant uh, rainfall, was there a, uh, was that a SWIP or a BMP failure? Uh, that allowed that to happen, or is that something that uh, uh, they're going to be able to remedy in the uh, in the future? Well, they have remedied it. Uh, they put it in according to the plan that was was prepared by their engineer. It just simply wasn't sufficient to stop basically the water coming down the driveway. So they put in some additional sedimentation pond and additional erosion control. And since that time, that's not not happened. Uh, I don't know that we've had, well, we had a pretty good rain uh, a week or two ago without any incidences. So I think they've addressed the problem. So it's not a going forward in the sense that they have to put up more erosion control. They have it in place and there hasn't since that, and that was at the very beginning of the project. Uh, so they they add they they did some uh, ditch modification out on the right of way, you know, in, in compliance with KDOT. They added additional riprap up the driveway, uh, and then I think they added some some sedimentation areas so that the water couldn't just run down the driveway. It was captured before it got to the top of the driveway and into the road. That's basically, what what they did, and and that was included during the public hearing. Uh, by the applicant. Okay, thanks. Nanny Construction. I'd like to move that we adopt the resolution 2020-03 uh, with conditions. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to adopt the uh, approved uh, resolution 2023-2003 with the uh, with the stipulations. Uh, would the clerk please call roll? And before I do that, this is Zach. Dave, real quick, does this require the vote of the mayor? Yeah, this is a governing body um, item, so okay. the mayor vote on it. Thank, thank you for clarifying that. I'm I will vote. <laughs> okay, Har. Yes. Malat? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Stites? Yes. Adams? Yes. And the mayor? Oh, yes, Mayor McTaggart. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you all for that. Okay, the next item on the agenda is to consider a uh, recommendation for, of approval for the Planning Commission regarding a special use permit for drinking establishment microbrewery purposes with an outdoor seating area at 10953 Call Drive and adopting resolution 2020-04 finalizing the same. Mr. Mayor Dave Nopic, um city planner again and members of the council. Um, this application came in on March 2nd of 2020. It is for the property address 10941 and 10953 Cod Drive. The reason it has both addresses is there's two buildings on the site. The SUP has to do with the building that is the west building of the highlighted site that you see on the screen before you. 
Um, that is the 10953 Cod Drive area. Outfield Brewery has been there now for a year in operating, so this is a renewal of their current special use permit. They are required to stay within their Kansas state licensing uh, requirements as well as local licensing requirements here at the city of Edwardsville. The property is located in a C2 retail com uh, commercial zoning district, uh, which allows for this type of use with the special use permit. Um, the renewal, again, is to continue the operation, but also to expand a portion of the business. Um, as you heard in the introduction to this, there is an outdoor seating area that is in between the two buildings currently. Um, and then the interior space is actually proposed to expand by about 400 square feet. Um, looking at the graphic or the picture in front of you, um, you can see roughly where the seating area would be, the concrete pad between the two buildings that is there today. Um, and then primarily the 400 square foot expansion on the interior space would be in the northwest corner of that building that's on the left hand side of the graphic in front of you. So um, on April 15th of 2019, the Planning Commission held their public hearing again online, similar to this meeting. Staff and business rep representatives were the only ones that spoke at the hearing. There were no uh, objections to the proposed use uh, that were voiced, and there have been no protest petitions filed in regard to this item. Um, the staff report outlines the 13 criteria that we look at in cases like this. Um, I won't go over those 13 criteria. If you have questions about those, just let me know. Uh, the applicant has provided a outline of their business plan in your packet and also a floor layout, if you will, that shows the expansion area in the building. Uh, what I will highlight about the resolution is that there are a couple of items that have changed here as part of the renewal. Um, condition number one in that resolution um, is instead of having the uh, special use permit end at 12, 12 months, um, this special use permit would become a permanent special use permit for this operator at this location, um, but it would have an annual administrative review. So what we would do is similar to the way we're handling um, Airbnbs um, and vacation rentals where the operator doesn't live on site, we do an annual administrative review. So the applicant will go through that review process um, and essentially what we do is we talk to the police department, fire department, surrounding neighbors will give a notice out to, to see if there's any problems or complaints that have been filed. If there are, then the applicant would have to come back through the more formal process with the planning commission and city council to look at those complaints and what's being done to address those. Otherwise, they would get an administrative uh, approval if there's nothing found through that uh, work. Condition number two, you'll notice the business hours, we're expanding those business hours by recommendation of the Planning Commission. The applicant was asking for an expansion of those hours. Um, we have created their hours that correspond with the state limitations on weekdays and have basically said that they can be open from 5 p.m. till 2 a.m. On, on those weekdays and then on Saturdays from 1 p.m. to 2 a.m. And then Sundays are one to six, which is a uh, shorter time than what's allowed by state regulations on Sundays. Um, the reason we've done this this way is the applicant did have a couple of uh, special requests during the past year where they wanted some expanded hours. Somebody won a Super Bowl and some other things happened. There, there's just stuff that, that kind of unfolded. Um, this would allow those things to happen. I think the plan um, is that in general, they will be closing um, earlier than the 2 a.m. Uh, timeline. They'll be more at that 10 or 11 uh, p.m. timeline. Um, then condition number eight, I just wanted to go to that one in the resolution uh, quickly to highlight that um, any future expansion of the drinking establishment or other uses in the building will be subject to a further administrative use or a review of the special use permit um, and those approvals. Um, there, if they do this expansion internally, um, there will be probably some building code requirements and things that they'll have to hit and get a building permit on. And also if they have some changes in operations, 
um, that occur that may create a scenario where there's modifications to the building. They'll have to go through that process, but they'll be able to, we'll be able to handle that through an administrative procedure. Then number nine um, is simply an acknowledgement, if you will, um, that if there is a transfer of business ownership or a sale of the business, essentially a new application for a new special use permit would have to be filed and the Planning Commission City Council would get to look at this again. Understand that a special use permit is issued to a particular property, but also to a particular user or applicant at the same time. Um, while this business operator has been very responsible over the past year um, in following various rules and regulations, and there's been no complaints about the facility or the operations, um, that doesn't mean whoever they sell to, if they ever sell the business, would comply with those same things. So this gives us an opportunity at the time of that ownership transfer um, to have that mm -hmm. manager come in with a new application. Um, with that, I'll stop there and stand ready for any questions that you may have. I noticed that one of the applicants may be online if there's questions for them. Hi Dave, this is Councilman Schreiber. Mm -hmm. Well, this is super exciting that it, the business is expanding. Um, does the business owner foresee any parking challenges with this? Yeah. Or do they have a, a good business relationship with the neighbor, the businesses that are neighboring right there for possibly their evening hours? Yep. Yeah. As far as as far as we're aware, none of the neighbors have had a problem with the parking scenario. We have required that they get shared parking agreements um, in order to meet their parking requirements. Condition number seven, you'll in the resolution is quite lengthy and it only has to do with parking. Um, they essentially, with the expansion, need a total of 28 parking spaces. I believe there's 17 available to them on site right now. They have submitted uh, shared parking agreements um, with the RAF factory property uh, parcel, um, and that helps them to meet those 28 um, spaces. So there has to be a good working relationship with those folks, um, and we've had with the parking um, agreements, um, we've gone through about three or four iterations, but I think we're we're getting very close to having the correct um, applications in and the, the, the correct forms filed on that. But they have not had, we haven't had any complaints about parking issues out there at all. Um, and I know they've been in contact with those adjacent building owners. Perfect, thank you so much. That's very encouraging, the business expansion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there any further questions? Okay, if not, the uh, chair would entertain a motion to approve. Mr. Mayor, Councilman Adams, I make a motion to adopt resolution 2020-04 regarding the special use permit. Uh, for the for 10953 Con Drive with the conditions stipulated in the report. This is Sites and I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve uh, resolution 2020-04 uh, with the uh, comments made. So uh, if no, no further questions, would the clerk please call roll? Kahar? Yes. Malat? Yes. Driver? Yes. Knight? Yes. Adams? Yes. And Mayor McTaggart? Yes. Very good. Thank you all. Okay. Um, the next Mr. item Mayor, is. I was gonna, Mr. Mayor, if I can jump in for just a second. Yes, go right um, ahead. Yeah, I just want to want everyone to be aware because I know the applicants on the on the phone also that the expansion that we've talked about as part of this is the interior expansion. I will let the council know that there have been um, some inquiries made by this applicant about how they might transform their business a little bit more and increase some of their outdoor space. They'll be coming to staff with that still for us to look at. 
um, and kind of review on that. So if you do see some activity in the coming months where it looks like they're expanding a little bit on the outside, it's likely because of the spacing requirements on the interior of the building and some of the adaptations they're gonna have to make to be operational. Um, so that outdoor space may be a temporary kind of expansion at that point in time. But I just wanted to make the council aware of that, um, as well as the applicant. This was not an approval for the exterior um, potential temporary expansion that the applicant has at least brought their inquiry to staff to and about. But um, that way, if you guys see something on the outside, you'll understand what's going on there. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay, are we uh, are we ready to move on then? Okay, yes, uh, the next item is consider submittal surface transportation program SDP projects for the federal fiscal year 2023-24. Mike? Well, that's very good. You got the federal fiscal year there. I wasn't sure of the FFY. Most people miss that one. So, uh, oh, I, you know, when I first saw that, what the heck is that? But I, I, I got it down now. <laughs> you're right. Well, just so everybody knows, the federal fiscal year, as we know, uh, I think runs September through uh, August. So it's up. It's not on the same cycles as either uh, the state or the city local government cycles. So uh, we, we we work within those parameters. Um, at the last meeting, we had brought to you a project that I'm referring to as the Blake Street Connector Project, which fundamentally was uh, to construct a sidewalk that would go basically from 4th Street into the park uh, and also look at on-street bike lanes. And by that, we're talking about a painted type bike lane that are typically about five feet wide. So they take out some of the width of the road. Uh, if I recall right, that road's about 40 feet curb to curb. And so we felt like it was an option uh, either to use that or the share the road and make it part of our overall project. Uh, I think generally uh, the council was uh, in support of that application. Uh, it's a fairly small project as far as dollars. Uh, it would be about a $400,000 project and a city contribution of about a third on this particular one. So about $150,000 uh, is what we what we estimate. Uh, in follow-up to that, uh, sorry, I'm trying to read my memo at the same time looking at the screen. Uh, there was questions about uh, looking at the 90, at looking at 98th Street. Uh, and so, uh, as you recall, uh, I'm going to go back a little bit, but in the 2019 bond program, we actually approved, uh, we initially estimated about 250000 uh, when the bonds got sold and everything came in. There was about 268000 that got allocated to do conceptual planning and right-of-way acquisition from Kansas Avenue to the North City Limits, which is just south of I-70. Uh, we had done a very similar uh, project like that for uh, 102nd Street. We ended up doing the preliminary or concept plans, but did not uh, pursue the right-of-way acquisition all the way to Riverview. We have not implemented that uh, particular project yet. Uh, as you know, we had a number of projects in there. So it's a very similar project. Um, also, in the latest round of the what, every five years, uh, the Mid America Regional Council updates its long range plan. And in every 10 years, it, it really does a call for kind of projects. We submitted uh, really on behalf of ourselves and uh, Kansas City, Kansas, 98th Street from uh, K32 all the way north to State uh, to State Avenue, so to improve that entire corridor. Uh, so that one did get included in the Mark Regional Transportation Plan that's known as the Connected KC 2050. I think in your packet I provided you a summary. Uh, all of those items in that plan are, are unfunded, but it's kind of the first step in getting plans uh, into the system and approved. Uh, but the project itself did rate as a 
basically received a good score and, and got support at what they call the high level. So they ranked them from high, medium, and low. Uh, and we had two projects that ended up in, in the high level, and this was one of those. Um, after the meeting last week, we asked BHC Roads to do a kind of a general concept cost to go from uh, Kansas Avenue, which as you know, we improved through this same program a few years back up to the city limit, uh, uh, terminating at the city limits. They put together uh, a very conceptual uh, pricing. They think it would be about 4.3 million. Uh, as I noted, it's an 80-20 funding mechanism, but they don't fund engineering. They don't fund right of way. Uh, they don't fund utilities. Uh, so we estimated it probably be closer to 50-50, maybe 60-40. Uh, when we submit programs, we always submit them at the 80-20. But having been through a number of these cycles, um, I'm not sure I've ever seen. I think there's one program. It was had multi-jurisdictions that got actually funded at the 80-20. I think that's the only one I've seen in probably the 15 years or 14 years I've been going to those. So uh, just to summarize, we, we can make multiple applications. At some point, we will have to make some decisions on priority of applications. Uh, sometimes it's based on funding. Sometimes they just want you to rank them. Uh, they have set up a different program, so it's a two-step program this time. So you make kind of your preliminary. They then run that through various committees and, and program reviews and then give you insight uh, into whether they think it's how it's going to you know, meet up with the other programs, gives you an opportunity to either add to it or maybe modify or remove it from the program. Uh, and, and so that happens. But the first the first round of this, uh, we have to have applications in in about two weeks and uh, can can do that. Uh, again, I think the, the Blake Street connector plan probably has a pretty good probability of, of some funding. Uh, last time we went around, there was a lot of discussions about being more supportive of sidewalk and sidewalk type of, of applications not necessarily only focus on trails. So there seemed to be some support for that. Uh, obviously this program, this particular project has uh, support in the Connect 2020, or Connect KC 2050 plan, uh, which will certainly help it. I think the downside if we if we have one is we did get you know funding in the last cycle. Uh, in about three million dollars for the Riverview Crossroads project, but if I've learned anything in all my years, uh, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. So we're happy to submit both of these projects, uh, but I told you I would come back at this meeting so you could uh, kind of have a review and have any questions. And uh, if it's the direction of the council to submit both of them, then we will submit both. Uh, both of the applications in this cycle and, and see where we go. That's pretty much all I have for kind of the, the formal presentation and be happy to answer any questions. And as far as action items, there's no, I wouldn't say there's a necessarily a formal action uh, motion second that's needed, uh, but just general direction by the council. Oh, uh, for me, I, I would I would certainly support um, you know moving ahead and, and trying to get as much as we can. Like you said, if you don't ask, it's always no. I don't I don't know if there's other comments or questions of the projects. So I would say that the it, the the, the uh, project would require you know bond funding but you're you know we're, we're talking three to four years out we do have uh preliminary money that we could do which we will do either way uh at least a level of uh what we would probably call field check plans on a project like this or concept plans but under kdot they would call it field check plans so that portion is already funded 
regardless of, of what happens at the STP level. Yeah, and, and as I understand, they do like to, to see cities do that. So. Yeah, they, they do prefer to have, I mean, they would prefer for when you actually submit in reality, they would prefer that you have the plans complete and the right of way uh, acquired and 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 if you got utilities out of the way, they really they're really really happy. That okay. happens, but that's you know that's always the, you know so to speak, making it completely shovel ready is kind of their preferred. Sure, sure. I think sure. Mike, yeah. um, go ahead, Malad. I think since uh, we've been working on the well, I think it would be a pretty good connector from. 435 Kansas 98th straight north up to where the new Menards and all that is I think it would definitely be something that we ought to consider putting a little bit of money in right now to, to get ahead of the game and that street really is horrible right now so I, I've got to agree with Chuck Stites on that one that's where my opinion is on that. This is Chuck Adams. I, know I would agree that the project is definitely needed and should be pursued. Hey, this is Carolyn. I really like both projects. Um, I like the idea of the Blake Street, um, especially with looking at the city center coming along and the new emphasis on parks and getting our, our students safely to the um, to the park and have a sidewalk to do that and then i know that some of our streets are in dire need of repair so if you feel like the timing's right on 98th street i would really encourage including that as well and just see if we might get approved on that um as long as you feel like the timing's right and the money's there the only thing i would i i would add is uh you know and i don't disagree that you know these streets uh the, the, you know, quite honestly, most of our north-south corridors, whether that's uh, uh, 94th, 98th, 102nd, uh, and some of the cross, you know, some of the cross streets like like a Schwartz or Richland or some of those, uh, were all the challenges. They were all county-style roads built on 40-foot right-of-ways, where you have pavements that range anywhere from 16 to maybe 20, 22 feet. And so the, the, the challenge is always repairing them, which, which probably means some type of, of patching or putting asphalt over the top of it. That's a short-term fix versus a large capital project doing something like we did on, you know, a Kansas Avenue or some of the things we're going to do on a Riverview, uh, you know, 110th Street. So it's always the it's it's the same challenge as always is, is allocating money for you know when I say short term I, you know making money available to do projects that you see with a five to ten year life I mean if if you look at Edwardsville Drive 110th Street Edwardsville Drive when we did that southern portion down there where we did the curb and gutter uh, we ended up spending oh about another half a million dollars to go through and mill the road down to the to the old concrete state highway which is again about 20 feet wide repaved it it's been a good surface uh but we kind of assumed that was about a 10-year fix and what we're starting to see is that reflective cracking coming through where the old concrete sections are the edges of the the road are starting to ravel you know some of those types of things which I think you would expect after 10 years without, you know, having the ability to go in there and put in, you know, proper edging, curbing or or things of that nature. So that's just the, the challenge that we will run into. And again, most of these roads, you know, the 94th, 98th, 102nd, you're talking, you know, four, you know, four miles north to south on each one of those roads. So, uh, you, you know, in this project, uh, I think the assumption was you're spending around uh, two, you know, or roughly you're spending a little over two million dollars a mile. So when you put it all, get it all in. So uh, it, it's expensive in, in that sense. So.
Well, Mayor, and us, I hear otherwise it sounds like there's okay. a support. All right, to well, uh, then the, the consensus is to move forward. Is that right, sir? That That is my understanding. Okay, uh, we will we will expect you to do that then. We will do it. Okay, thank you. Okay, next item is will be uh, Zach on the here the presentation regarding quarter one budget review for 2020. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, we started doing this last year, and then we're going to follow the same format as we normally have. Uh, so this will be the review of the first quarter uh, budget performance for 2020, uh, starting with uh, just a quick look back at 2019, the, our budgeted numbers versus our estimated numbers versus our unaudited actual numbers. So if you take a look at this graph, the far left bars represent the adopted budget in 2019 that the council approved in August of 2018. The middle bars show the estimated revenue and expenditure levels at the time the 2020 budget was adopted, so August of 2019, so about a year after the far left bars. The far right bars are our unaudited revenue and expenditure levels for the year end 2019 as current as, as we've got them. Now we've got the audit ongoing now, and we'll be hearing more from that in a couple of weeks. Uh, but that's how it stands right now. So if you look at that, uh, the expenses about uh, about forty. There was about a forty thousand dollar increase from adopted twenty nineteen to actual twenty nineteen, which equates to less than a one percent uh, variation between adopting in August of twenty eighteen and then the uh, uh, year end in twenty nineteen. So the short story there is between between you know almost a year and a half uh, worth of activity. We were able to, staff was able to to accurately predict within, on the expenditure side, within 1% of where our unaudited figures ended up uh, for expenditures. And then we actually were 1.2% to the good on our revenue side. So all that to say is the, you know, history, if, if history is an indication, our, our projections have been accurate uh, to a degree of, of 1.0 to 1.2 percent as far as revenues and expenditures goes. Now we're going to start going through our major sources of general fund revenue, which in the past uh, we've defined as revenue items where we collect more than $100,000 worth of, of revenues throughout the year. And we're going to start with property taxes. Uh, so property taxes are reported in January, March, June, September, and October. So as of the first quarter where we collected our January and our March uh, distributions, uh, we've collected just shy of $1.5 million in our property taxes, which makes up about 60% of, of our budgeted total for the year. That puts us a little bit ahead of where we normally are. If you take uh, 2016 to 2019 and look where we, uh, where we performed uh, in the first quarter compared to our, our year end, we were at about 56% of that total revenue. So again, we're a little bit ahead in terms of property taxes, uh, which is good. One of our, one of the items that staff was particularly concerned about at the state level was whether or not the property tax deadline would be pushed due to the ongoing, I mean, complications regarding the, the current public health situation. That was not the case. Um, now that said, about 40% of our revenue is still outstanding. We get most of that in our June distribution. Obviously, you know, different, by and large, we receive most of our, our property taxes through, you know, the traditional uh, mortgage companies. And so those, those have been sitting in escrow waiting to come to us. Had those been delayed a little bit, we would have, we would have been working with really speculative numbers as we got into the meat of our 2021 budget planning. Uh, so we were thankful to see that that budget deadline was not extended. Uh, it still kind of remains to be seen how those revenues are going to come in. Now, as a reminder, we do budget at 97% collection rate. So we do have, you know, we've got those two things working for us that we do not budget for 100% collection rate like the state worksheets would, would like us to do. And at least currently, we are performing uh, above average as far as our first three months of revenue collection is concerned. So 
good news on the property tax front. Similarly, on the sales tax front, um, we budgeted about a little bit more than $1.5 million in a combination between city sales, city use, county sales, and county use taxes. Uh, right now, we've collected about $376,000 of that. That represents 25% of the 2020 of the, the budget. Uh, normally, if you take a look at the 2016 to 2019 average, we're at 23%. So again, we're, we're performing better than we have been uh, uh, in over the last four year average. Uh, that starts to be a little bit more pronounced. We've got some data for April. So that's the, this table shows the April sales tax collection uh, as it relates to 2016 to 2019 comparisons. So we're, we're performing pretty well. And this is, if you remember, you know, there was a couple of these quarterly budget reports from last year where we were continually trailing. And it really wasn't until that last quarter that we started to catch up. And between the last quarter of 2019 and the first quarter of 2020, sales taxes have been pretty strong. Now, I say all that as a kind of a as a lead in. So sales tax distributions uh, are received by communities about two months after they are collected. So that means the April sales tax that we see um, represented in this graph, the January through April, is only as recent as February. We'll begin to see declines due to the you know the various stay stay at home orders and the just people self-quarantining and doing you know those kind of uh, precautionary measures uh, we're going to start seeing that with our may distribution because that's going to start showing us uh, the march collection numbers um, the steepest decline that we're anticipating is going to be in the june distribution that will be showing the the april numbers so we've got a couple different models that we've put together that you know we're, we're extremely early into the year but we still want to try to get out ahead of as some of these concerns as we can. Uh, but really the, the common denominator among all our models is that they start with the reductions in revenues showing in March with a steeper decline in April and then various degrees of recovery as the years, as the, as the months go progress throughout the year. So we're trying to be pretty conservative and assuming, you know, what, what we're hoping is gonna be larger losses that are actually experienced um especially this early in the year we don't want to we don't want to overestimate what our revenues are going to be uh there's just still a lot out there that we're not we're not exactly uh sure how it's going to shake out now as far as from a local perspective you know when, when when you boil down to the details of who's actually paying our sales taxes in the city of edwardsville you know a lot of those are not going don't aren't the the areas that are typically you know thought of as as the ones being hit the hardest by some of these public health measures. So, you know, we're just we just don't have a a, a really deep roster of of restaurants and retail. And you know, that's what those are the stories you're seeing in the news of those types of businesses suffering. I mean, our gas stations are 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 the the, the Dollar General we've got in town. Um, we get a lot of sales taxes actually from utility companies. Um, all that to say is those are still rel. I mean, in com in comparison to the rest of the the sales tax uh, providing world those areas are the ones that are performing as stable as, as can be as can be hoped for so we're starting from a a pretty strong position going into the first three and four months of the year as far as sales taxes are going but right now we're we're anticipating you know somewhere between the 13 to 50 percent decline in total sales taxes from adopted 2020 figures so that's that's about an 11% decrease from our unaudited 2019 year-end collection. Uh, and then in dollar amount, it's close to about that $200,000. So while we are, you know, we're Edwardsville really uniquely positioned in the world of sales tax revenue, that gives us some, you know, level of stability that other communities might not have. And you know, we're still going to feel some kind of hit in that sales tax area. For franchise fees, uh, quarter one total comes to a little less than $130,000. That's at 24% of our budgeted total. Um, we're usually at, at 24% at this point in the year, so we're, we're performing pretty on schedule for that. 
uh, again, the effects of, of some of the public health concerns kind of remain to be seen from a franchise fee perspective, especially in Edwardsville, where we didn't have a lot of businesses actually shut down and would not be paying franch or paying their utility bills, which go into the franchise taxes. Uh, I know Atmos has indicated that they don't anticipate a, a you know, they anticipate a hit, but not to a, a, a some of the degrees that some of the other areas have been hit by, and that their payments are actually based on gross receipt versus, you know, net revenue received. Now, I will say that April, and taking a look at the April, I didn't have time to put their graph together, but based on what's been collected in April so far, we are about April, the, the month of April is about 8% less than, you know, it's just, it's the previous four years. So that might be indicative of, you know, how the, how the next couple months are going to shake out, or it might just be kind of a temporary thing as those, you know, as some of these uh, 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 wider public health implications started to seep its way into these different areas. But obviously we'll take a, we'll be keeping an eye on it. And, you know, as far as the first three months of the year goes, we're performing right on schedule. Gaming revenue uh, is, is obviously going to be a concern going forward. Uh, right now, we have, uh, we're, we're ahead of where we normally at. Normally, we've collected about 23% of our, of our total revenue for the year. We're at 26% of what we adopted. Uh, now, that said, the casinos were ordered to close in mid-March. Gaming revenue operates as similarly to sales taxes in that it's about a two-month lag between when the revenues are collected by the entity and when they're distributed to the communities. So we won't be seeing the impacts of the casino closure until we get our May distribution later this month. Uh, obviously, our our April distribution is going to suffer a lot because it's been closed this entire time. Uh, I've I've unless something's been put out publicly that I've missed, I've not heard of of when the casino is is you know thinking that they're going to be back open. But you know that's that's we get consistently about. Thirty-two to thirty-five thousand dollars a month from casino revenue. That's a pretty, you know, that's a pretty standard rate of return that we can expect from them. And you know, right now we're just we're essentially budgeting pretty close to zero dollars collected whenever we start seeing our distributions from April. And that's you know, depending on how long that lasts. That's gonna, it's definitely gonna leave a a, a mark as far as our revenues go. But fortunately, we're we're performing strong at this point in the year. That'll hopefully cushion whatever the blow is going to be as 2020 continues on. Court fines uh, for the uh, for this year, we've collected just shy of $100,000 in the first three months. Uh, how we budget for court fines, we use a running four-year average of our, of our actual revenues to kind of get an estimate for our budget revenues for the current year. Um, the last couple of years we've outperformed those. So those are, you know, we've had just uh, a lot of court activity. Right now we've collected 28% of our adopted revenue. Uh, usually we're at 24% at this point in the year of what the year end revenue ends up being. So again, we're performing pretty strongly the first year in court fines. Uh, it, we had to, we postponed the hearings that were, or the dockets I should say, for the second docket in March and all of the dockets in April. So normally we conduct municipal court the first and third Thursdays of the month. Uh, because of you know having to, to, to deal with this backlog, we've actually got six uh, dockets set in the month of May. Now we have taken some uh, precautions. We've moved all of our court activity over to uh, the community center and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that during the the staff comments, um, but, but all that to say is that's that's helping us work through that backlog uh, throughout the month of, of May and as safe and as efficient way as we can. And so we're not trying to cram everybody in and have you know a docket of 400 cases on a single day. We're trying to space it out over that period of six dockets so we can hopefully get to a, a more sense of normalcy once once June starts. We might. Depending on how things come together, we might still need to schedule an additional docket in June, but uh, we're keeping it, the, the the court team has been working really well together, and I'm pretty confident that if you know if we even if we do have to schedule another docket in June to handle that backlog, um, well, we are we're moving through the the cases that have been postponed earlier in the year at a pretty good clip. 
Um, but again, pretty performing pretty strongly in the first three months as far as municipal court goes. For ambulance fees, we are performing right at our average, um, maybe a little bit above. Normally, we're at 25% of total revenue collected uh, this, at the first three months of the year for the January through March of 2020. Uh, we've collected uh, just shy of uh, about probably about 45,000, and that puts us at about 26% of our adopted revenue for for 2020. Uh, even when calls are, as you can see in that number right there, slightly down from that first quarter, um, that's not a that's not the best apples to apples comparison, but it's a good indicator of where your revenues would be. But calls are calls look to be down a little bit, but at least revenue collections have not fallen to that degree, and we're actually performing a little bit better than we were compared to last year. Motor vehicle taxes, not a whole lot to report there. Quarter one total at this point is 32,000. Um, that's, that's, that's actually closer to, to you know 29% of our adopted revenue. And we're normally at this point in the year, we're at 22%. So again, performing strongly, hopefully it's gonna offset some of the impacts that we see later on in the year. So the short story for general fund revenues is that you know, in our major areas and the in the revenue items that we're collecting over a hundred thousand uh, dollars every year, you know, we're performing strongly, uh, much more strongly than we were at this point in 2019. But all that to say is the the most critical months are going to be the next you know two to three months when we start to see collections and start to get a better sense of the impact of the stay at home orders and the and the different public health precautions that people are taking and how that's going to affect our bottom line. Um, that's when we'll really start to firm up some of our, our projections and get a, a better sense of how it's going to affect, you know, fund balance, operations, pretty much all general fund activity is really going to be shaped by how these next three months of revenues come in. Um, at least that that's going to set the stage for it. Um, obviously, you know, the, the, current public health situation is what it is. It's very fluid. And it, it's, you know, six weeks ago, it would have been hard to describe where we're at now. So I, I hesitate to try and posit where we're going to be six weeks from now. But we can take some comfort in that we are performing stronger uh, than we usually are in the first three months of the year and really just performing strongly overall as a, a from a revenue perspective. Uh, I think we can probably anticipate uh, between a five to seven percent decrease in overall revenues. I mean, that's going to represent between three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars once you once you get down to the actual numbers, and that's going to be a you know it's all told it's 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 not as pronounced as some of the other communities surrounding us that are more dependent on sales tax, but it's it's not nothing. So it's it's staff's going to be extra vigilant in in paying attention to those numbers and and forming recommendations for both the remainder of this year's budget and the 2021 budget as we start getting into the planning mode for that. So I'm going to pause real quick to see if we've got any questions on, on the revenue side of it. Sounds like we're okay. All right. Well, then I will continue on. For general fund expenses, I'm going to go for kind of a, a broader picture. So right now we're at about 25% of where our uh, adopted expenditure levels were for 2020. The 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 2016 to 2019 average percentage of where we're at this year is 25%. So we're performing, you know, right at those levels uh, that that history seems to dictate. We're actually a little bit uh, less from a dollars level when you look at uh, comparing us to 2019. And a lot of our a lot of our payments are front loaded in the first quarter. So our workman's comp, uh, vehicle payments, uh, things like that. Now I, I will remind you that our, our those, those 2019 numbers are unaudited. So we'll get more firm figures of that as we move forward. Uh, also the payroll and, and, and benefit costs for 2020, you know, those are gonna sh shift slightly as we, as we as the 
as you know, we switched over to a third party payroll system. And as that payroll system becomes more in line with the city's general ledger, then we'll have more accurate figures in, in those areas. Uh, all that said, though, the any shift in the payroll and benefits areas as far as reporting for expenditures, and you know, we expect that to be pretty minor. And this is a this is a pretty good snapshot of where we're at at this point as far as general fund expenses. For our other funds, revenue and expense reports, we'll start off with the uh, debt service fund. The revenues that have currently been collected for the debt service fund include our you know, our property tax distribution, as was in the general fund revenues, we've got some motor vehicle taxes. We also had one of our IRB payments come in. Um, so not really a whole lot of surprises in the debt service fund at this point. Special sales taxes, typically at this point in the year, we do, if you looked at our first quarter 2019 um, sales or special sales tax breakdown, uh, there was some costs in there associated with the fire trucks, um, both our new incoming fire truck and our old outgoing fire truck. So the timing of that really just means we didn't have any any major expenses come out of the special sales tax fund in the first three months of the year. Uh, but we did collect about seventy six thousand uh, dollars in special sales and use taxes. Special highway fund, this revenue comes from state highway fund and county highway fund. Um, the expenditures so far have all been related to uh, snow and ice operations and some street maintenance. Um, so again, at this point, not a whole lot to report in the special highway fund. Our economic development fund, we received $48,000 from Chicago title in March and we counted that as miscellaneous revenue in our EcoDevo fund. Um, we didn't really budget any revenue coming into that fund. So that's, I think that was just more of a timing for some of the projects we've got going on more than anything. Um, but yeah, economic development doesn't have a whole lot to report as far as activity goes. For a solid waste fund, uh, we're keeping pace, uh, which is which is good to see. You know, it's those, those margins between quarter one revenue and quarter one expenses is a really slim, which is as long as they're to the good at this point, I'm I'm okay with it, especially considering we didn't collect any late fees uh, related to, to solid waste or sewer charges in the month of March. And and we haven't, we will have some, you know, a lot of people have been calling already asking about our citywide cleanup. At this point, we know, we know for sure it's not gonna happen on schedule. And there is some cost associated with that because we do rent those uh, the additional 40 yard containers that aren't, contain that aren't included in our uh, solid waste contract with waste management. That will be pushed off to some point later on in the summer. Um, waste management made that call pretty early to all the communities to kind of put the put a halt on some of those those larger scale activities. Um, so that's really the, the 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 most major development in the in the solid waste fund uh, to this point. Sewer fund, uh, again, not a, not a whole lot to report. Revenues are coming in strong for that first quarter and expenses mostly related to uh, um, uh, payroll coming out of the sewer fund. And that's a, that's a broad overview of, of where we're at for the first quarter and our funds and our budgeted funds anyway. If you've got specific questions, I, I'd entertain those now. Uh, if you think of anything else, you know, we've got some more supporting data that we could share with you. Mm -hmm. If you want to dig, you know, more in the weeds on some of those detail reports, um, just let me know. But that's, that's where we're at. Really, the short story is, from a revenue standpoint, performing pretty strongly in the first three months, which is good, because uh, it's going to help cushion the blow that we know we're going to hit it, it, it probably if summer starts hitting on. Uh, and also we were pretty conservative because if you remember when we were budgeting in, for 2020, you know, around that, that, that late in the summer for 2019, that's around, that's right around where revenues weren't really coming in as hot as where we anticipated. So we budgeted pretty conservatively as far as, you know, how revenue was going to either increase or decrease in 2020. And because they're performing stronger than those estimates, you know, we're performing stronger than than where we normally are in a lot of areas in relation to what we had budgeted. Um, 
So we already anticipated some kind of, of you know, depression in some of our revenues, even as far back as 2019, just based on how those numbers were coming in. Um, obviously, it's going to be a little bit more pronounced as the year goes on, but we've got some some structural advantages that will hopefully cushion the blow going forward. And that's that's all I've got. Zach, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Zach. We'll, yeah, go ahead with any questions. I just had a quick question, and it it might um, you might have an easy answer for it. I was just wondering, since we aren't paying a salary right now for a public works director or health benefits, if that would help um, in our budget, since we're saving some of that money, if that helps up with the revenue loss. That, that does help offset the revenue loss. And I know Michael probably have some updates related to our public works director and his staff comments. But when we budget for new positions, we budget them uh, for an entire year. Uh, and we really, we didn't, uh, we budgeted having our same public works director when we adopted the 2020 budget. Um, yeah, she, she did not uh, resign her position until very late in the year. Um, so we had anticipating having a public works director on for all 12 months with with you know a certain level of benefits. Same thing goes for our our current public works position that is, or I should say, our our parks and rec groundskeeper position that is so far that we've been waiting to fill till our public works director came on. You know, we anticipated that that person would be on the job starting January 1, taking the maximum level of benefits. So that's. That is certain. That will certainly help because it's been, you know, it's been at least since this first five months since those positions have, have been filled. That will definitely help in our, you know, once we get to the bottom line as far as offsetting some of those losses in revenues because we're not incurring those first five months of expenses associated with those two positions. I might just add to that that. Uh... There, there's some other items that typically we budget for, uh, you know, certain travel budgets or things like that, that have just been canceled. Just, I mean, because, the, you know, they're, they're just not holding them or having them or some of those. So I think there's a number of areas as we get into the second quarter and we start looking at our 2021 budget that some of that, some of that loss will be made up. I guess naturally in the sense that, uh, you know, we don't foresee taking drastic, you know, measures like furloughing all of our staff uh, or things of that nature. I do think we'll probably see some reduction in fund balance, but again, the purpose of having a fund balance is mm -hmm. to offset those times when you have, uh, you know, unexpected emergency so it's, it's not for the routine stuff it's for the things that aren't routine in nature and i think we can clearly all agree that this is not a routine year uh so um you know i think we have the right pieces in play that will help us get you know get through this i mean there are certainly some unknowns such as you know casino revenues and and even if it reopens out of those you know, what, what do they do? Uh, you know, some of our other, you know, how much will schools being closed, right? They're a big user of utilities. So how will they impact franchise fees? I think it's going to be more of those kind of things as we go forward. But, you know, we, we're kind of early on in, in kind of assessing some of those impacts. I don't think we felt like it was necessary to go make some drastic changes early in the process, I, you know, for some cities, you know, maybe in Olathe or in Overland Park or places where they have significant sales tax or, you know, I mean, there's cities that have 60, 40 to 60 percent of all their revenue is from sales tax. Certainly those are hard to, to offset where I guess it's one of the times when you're probably glad you don't have, uh, you know, big sales tax. I think the other day I said, glad we don't have a swimming pool to have to try to decide if we're going to open it or not open it. So uh, we, we may have some benefits that we didn't even know we had until this event came along. So. Hi, Zach. This is Margaret. I had a quick question and maybe I heard it wrong, but could you explain again that waste management 
is postponing our citywide cleanup. Correct? Yes. I mean, waste management uh, reached out probably towards the end of March, if I'm remembering correctly. It really just is a broad uh, request to all the communities that they work with, just letting them know, you know, generally just kind of the, the safety precautions that their staff are taking, and then also to ask at this time, if you have scheduled cleanup events similar to the citywide cleanup, please, and we ask that you postpone those uh, until there's, you know, we get a better handle on, on the larger kind of public health implications. So they're not, you know, it's at that point, I don't think it was, you know, there was still a lot of unknowns uh, as far as how specifically waste management was going to, you know, structure their operations in response to everything and keeping their people safe. I think right now it's been, you know, we, we've not, we've not tried to reschedule it for the normal third Saturday in May because of, you know, even though we're starting to see some of our restrictions be lifted, um, right. We right. won't be in the second phase of the state plan until May 18th, and right. it's, you know, we're just trying to make it, we have every intention of holding that event just in the month of sure. May with as, with as much, you know, variability going on with the, with the public health situation and, and people gathering and social distancing. It's, it seems more prudent at this point to put a hold on it for now, but, but plan on it for later in the summer. Right, but you you said in that same statement that we may have to pay some fees or something, or or no, what I what I meant was that there are there there is some cost associated with the with holding that event that comes out of the solid waste fund the rental of the additional oh. container, the big one, I, and so I thought, we won't I thought we, we won't see be... those costs. Yeah, yeah okay, we won't see those costs. Sense. Yeah, in the normal time that we see them, it'll be later on in the summer. Gotcha. I thought waste management was going to charge us something for rescheduling. Okay, now that makes yeah. sense. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, I might add uh, because I've seen this, and so so they're doing the same thing in a number of other communities. And part of what I've read and in, in, in reasoning is that. Uh, actually their residential collections are up quite a bit so they're dry, part of it. it's not the only thing but because people have been home obviously they're throwing out more garbage and in some respects that's slowing up the routes and their drivers have certain limited number of hours that they can drive so part of it has just been the type of service uh, again i can take a truck and pull up to a you know, a six or an eight yard front load container and dump it, or I can go to 10 or 15 houses to get the same amount of garbage. So there's there's some benefit to commercial routes over residential routes. And then of course, I think as Zach noted, just, uh, you know, safety for their people and then safety relative to the public at large of not having, you know, things that would increase the amount of gatherings or, or, you know, close contacts or things like that. So I think it's a, a combination of items that is pushing, uh, you know, pushing this item, idea of not holding these collection events right now, uh, you know, wherever they're at. I mean, I, I, it, it's, it's not just unique to Edwardsville in that sense. I've seen them doing the same thing in a number of other communities. Okay, if there are no further questions, uh, we can move on to the uh, staff reports. Uh, well, Mayor, I guess I'll start with mine. Uh, I do want to thank uh, uh, Zach for doing the budget updates. Uh, you know, that was one of our been one of our goals uh, to do that to keep to keep you all informed, keep the public informed as to what's going on. Again, I think we're trying to. You know, it's good that we had, a, a, I think, a strong first quarter. Um, I, that's going to help us in the, in the long run. I think some of these items are going to be interesting to see how sales tax goes. I think at the state level, on one of the calls I was on, they noted that uh, because they've already, they've already received the April revenues, 
they just haven't distributed them. And I think they said sales tax, you know, your general sales taxes were down about four and a half percent, five percent, which is about what they expected. And then in the next month, probably somewhere in the 10 to 12 percent. But that the use tax and remember, use tax are items where uh, you may buy something and have it delivered to your home. So you're buying it maybe out of state or, uh, you know, we we'll use Nebraska Furniture Mart. You buy something from Nebraska Furniture Mart and have it delivered to your home, then that becomes a sale uh, or a use tax at Edwardsville versus if you go to Nebraska Furniture Mart and pick it up, then it's a sales tax at uh, Nebraska Furniture Mart or Kansas City, Kansas. So they were seeing increases in use taxes uh, in into, I think they said 12 or 14 percent. I don't think they expected that kind of a, of a growth. Now, dollar for dollar, it doesn't offset, but I think it will be interesting as we move forward in the budget reviews and, and where we're at to see how, uh, you know, how that will work out, uh, uh, you know, for us one way or the other. Uh, versus our regular sales tax customers or, you know, one of our big ones, obviously, is Dollar General. And as you know, nationwide, Dollar General is, has probably, you know, are, they're on the swing for sales. Um, and we don't have a lot of uh, specialty retailers that would have been closed during this time. So uh, hopefully we'll, you know, we'll, we'll not have great news, but maybe the news won't be as bad as we might expect. Um, would just note uh, kind of on the financial areas that uh, we will, we're in process of the audit uh, and it'll either be at your next meeting that it's presented or the first meeting in June. Uh, we're a little bit ahead on that, but they're still working on some items. So uh, we're not ready to say it'll be at our next meeting, but it's possible. So. <laughs> You know, hopefully we'll have that. It'll be good information to have kind of the 2019 uh, audit completed at that time. Um, on just a, a couple of capital projects, I'll cover Public Works while I'm at it. Uh, uh, our Public Works crew is back, you know, kind of full staffing. Uh, as you know, they're, they're working in the parks and the cemeteries and the streets at the community center uh in any number of places and so they're they're staying active and busy um we have our fourth street project the quiet zone project so the quiet zone's larger i've heard from the county that that is still a budgeted you know in the budget the i think about two million dollars that they've allocated that is still a go uh and we are still moving forward with just getting the necessary uh, construction easements on 4th Street. I think we probably have probably a little more than a third of those taken care of thus far. There's a couple of people that just have questions about the project that we're working through. Uh, 110th and Riverview, the Riverview Crossroads project, we're in, uh, in the process on, uh, uh, in, on the right of way up there. We've had a couple that have, uh, uh, you know, We've come to terms, I guess, and, and we have signed documents on. We have a couple that we're still working through. So uh, we'll continue with that process and and uh, maybe back before you at the next meeting with some updates on that. Um, let's see, and I hate to bounce around a little bit. I know I think uh, I'll, Zach's going to give you some update on the court, so I'll, I'll leave that to him. Um, I will say that as far as city operations, City Hall, last week we we were in, we were here uh, with staffing and we had the doors open from eight to one. This week we have City Hall doors are open eight to five with full staffing. Obviously we're still taking precautions, still some, some schedule modifications, uh, you know, limiting number of people coming in and out of City Hall. Uh, but we've had a lot of people transition to paying online or paying through other ways, and that seems to be uh, be working. Uh, and uh, again, I think court and all that, Zach, get the court stuff. Um, 
relative to COVID, the whole COVID-19 uh, issues, uh, I would continue to suggest watching the the uh, UG's hub site uh, that they have out there. We we are now into, I guess, what they call the the red zone in the in the Wyandotte County plan, and we're in phase two of the state plan. There are some differences between those uh, that you, you can look at. Um, I would say at least uh, in the past week or so, um, you know, while cases are still seem to be going up, a lot of them are based around certain testing clusters. Um, at least for this past week, I think for the last five to seven days, there's only been one additional death in Wyandotte County. Uh, so uh, be looking forward to the day that there's zero uh, COVID related deaths, hopefully, but uh, there does seem to be some shift in, in that area and we'll continue to watch that. Uh, and then the, we have been in discussions or uh, discussions, I guess, with the, with the UG and the health department to bring a testing site to Edwardsville, uh, not this week, but probably in the following week. And we're looking likely using the community center parking lot for that. So uh, to have, a, they call them kind of pop-up testing sites. So they're generally uh, three to three to four hours at a site. Uh, and once we have more information on that, we will we will get that out. We felt like likely the best area would be the community center, the community center parking lot, because it has uh, better access for both people that may be driving or walking or coming out of the industrial park. So we wanted to, to find a good location for that. And then last, uh, at least for now, unless there's questions, uh, I have uh, made an offer and an offer has been accepted for public works director, a uh, gentleman by the name of Dustin Zinger. Um, he is uh, currently uh, probably telling his commission about right now that he's accepting the position here. He is the public works uh, administrator for Republic County, which is out in the western part of Kansas. Um, has a, a really good background uh, degree from K-State in construction management, uh, worked in the family construction business and then moved over to the public works area uh, in, in the, the county area. Uh, was relocating to this area because he plans to get married in September. Uh, hopefully his plans still can go forward uh, and his fiance is uh, attached with KU in the medical school. She's going to be a doctor or working on that. So they will be here in the area. Uh, uh, they don't have any children, but they have a couple of uh, dogs, including uh, I can't remember the name of the one that he rescued from the KCK animal shelter. So. Uh, they have some connections. Uh, I don't know that I know them all to the area, but he is scheduled to start June 1. So uh, that'll be good timing and we will get him uh, in and connected pretty quick. I think he's going to be a good asset. Uh, he he kind of brings a, a kind of that, that public works director style where uh, he, he certainly has the background educationally, but he can also go out and, you know, jump on a motor grader if he has to uh and you know can weld something if he has to so he kind of has that those hands-on skills as well as those administrative skills so we look forward to having him on board here in the next few weeks and with that uh that is all i have like i said i think uh, uh zach has a couple updates and uh i'll i'll leave those to him hey zach go ahead uh, yeah, the two updates I've got is we will be having our our um, May CPPS board meeting, our first one since the inaugural meeting back in March. Uh, that'll be taking place this Wednesday. It'll be a go-to meeting. Um, so the credentials are, I believe, have been sent out. If they've not, they'll be posted uh, online and on our social media tomorrow. So hopefully folks uh, who are interested in that uh, will be able to, to participate in that meeting similarly how they've participated in in our past couple city council meetings. Uh, and I did want to just thank all the departments and all of our staff. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we moved over public work, or excuse me, we moved over municipal court to 
the community center and why on the face of it that sounds like a you know an easy enough operation you know just hold court in the community center versus um city hall you know in reality it's pretty it this is a good example of a project that just could not have come together were it not for the combined participation of all of the departments between public works getting the space set up our court staff providing their insight on on you know how how court actually runs and when they're running the court um so that's our clerk staff as well as our prosecutor and the judge our police staff our police chief especially um was very involved in making sure all the the technical aspects of it were uh where they needed to be uh and then uh, captain short was very involved in setting up the logistics of how the room would be set up to maintain security our fire department and, and EMS have a EMT there on all six dockets, taking temperatures, making sure that, that nobody needs to be red flagged for a health perspective. So we are we're making sure that the center, uh, the people going into the center aren't posing, you know, a, a substantial health risk with, you know, all things considered. Um, in the long, in the short term, it's it's obviously just a much better location than cramming everybody into city hall. In the long term, it, it's it's kind of that same story. It'll just be, it's a better it, it's a better use of or it's a better site for that purpose than what City Hall was. Um, it's just got more space. It's not going to interrupt the the efficiency of City Hall during court dates. Uh, at some point, it'll get back to a relatively normal schedule. And right now, all of our court staffs doing a fantastic job working through that backlog. And and, and again, it just it was. This this project, more than anything, as recently, uh, by my estimation, is just a really good example of all the boats heading in the right direction to improve efficiency within a city department, and improve service levels to the participants in municipal court, and to help, help promote the the overall public safety. So I do want to thank all the department heads and make sure that the that the mayor and, and council are are well aware of of all their efforts. Um, and that's all I've got. Okay, thank you, Zach. Uh, Chief Mathis. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, nothing terribly uh, great to note here other than, uh, first and foremost, uh, all the personnel are healthy and safe. And we had a nuisance offender up on 98th Street, if you might remember some of that publicity. Uh, he is currently a resident of the Wyandotte County Jail, uh, thanks to good work by our officers and uh, coordinating uh, with the county to accept him to the jail because they are not accepting a number of prisoners, as you might imagine. So uh, we've had some good work and we're kind of back to some routine business, but at the same time, keeping some of those uh, COVID standards in place. And that's our report. Thank you, Chief. Chief Whittem. Hey, this is Ben Morrow. I'm not sure that uh, Chief Whittem's able Thank to stay. Thank you. We'll continue then. Go ahead. We've been speaking, and uh, he he doesn't have anything to report today. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, no public works uh, report. So, uh, Lisa, anything from you? I don't have anything at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to start with Councilman Adams. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, have a couple things. One is, Mike, how are we anticipating advertising or getting the news out on those on that testing site to our residents? Um, we will work through uh, probably a number of channels. So we'll, we'll use our traditional things that we use with the city, but also the public health department uh, will get that information out. Uh, they've been uh, pretty active with the media. So like even this week on one of the news stations, I think it was 41, where they listed each of the sites and the times. Um, and so we, we'll do it through those kind of traditional means, but there's quite a bit also coming out of public health. Uh, they're able to also do, uh, you know, bilingual announcements, main, mainly uh, uh, you know, Spanish announcements, but they also have contacts with other languages that needed be. But, uh, but, but that's how we'll, we'll do it. We'll work with public health to uh, get get the word out. We, we'll also work with our traditional relationships with the mobile home park 
to help get the word out uh, and you know use City Hall, et cetera. So uh, I think normally what I'm hearing uh, at these pop-up sites, they're generally getting somewhere, yeah, I, I'm gonna say probably around 40 or 50 tests done at a, at a pop-up site uh, at, at, you know, on any given day seems to be about the average. I know they've had some days where it's been more than that, but uh, at least what we're on a daily call and uh, when they talk about pop-up sites, that seems to be about the the numbers that they're that they're getting through those or the public health. So the public health department still has its site open. There's also going to be, I think uh, Walmarts are doing uh, their own testing, they coordinate with public health. So uh, I think the Bonner Springs Walmart and the, the Speedway Walmart up there off of Parallel <clears throat> will be coming online in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, you know, I, I reached out to the public health, uh, you know, in, in our demographic 66111, which includes more than our city, uh, we have about 25 plus confirmed cases. Uh, we have one of our employers that they've listed as a, as a quote, hot spot uh, where there's been six confirmed cases in their workforce now. They may not have, as a lot of these, they may have contracted the disease at some other location at home or, or you know, some other location uh, and then became ill and then notified their employer. So they may, it may get tagged with, a local workplace, even though that may not be where the person came, you know, originally came in contact. So I, a little more than you asked, but that's uh, that's kind of the general plan. I don't have a specific date. We got to work out, <clears throat> you know, obviously we don't want to be doing a pop-up test site when we have court going on there, uh, just the conflicts. And we want to certainly avoid the, uh, the noontime lunch program which now is, I think, just 11.30 to 12.30. So we'll, we'll want to make sure to avoid that. Most of them are either one to five or three to six is typically what their, uh, their times that they're working with. So um, is their goal, well, not two questions. Is their goal to get as many as possible tested or is it only those with symptoms? Uh, their goal, they listed the other day, they want to test 10% uh, of the total population. So they want to have about 16,000 total tests. Uh, I believe they would like to achieve that by the end of July. Um, and that's not necessarily only people that are, uh, that are symptomatic. Right now, uh, there's, you still if you come, you, sh you should have one, at least one symptom in the last 48 hours. But so that symptom could be, I've had a cough, I, I could have had a fever, I could have had body aches, I could have loss of taste, uh, you know, there's two or three others. So you don't have to have, as it was early on, where you had to have a fever plus two different, plus two additional symptoms now, they're basically saying if you've had a symptom in the last 48 hours, then you you would be eligible for testing. Okay. The other thing is if that would if the goal is 10%, that's that's 450 people from Edwardsville. And so based on 50 tests to visit, they they need to be here 10 times to do that. And so um, I wondered if we had to do some extra signage, like maybe some uh, temporary billboards like at 4th uh, Street and 32 and 435 in Midland to or wherever it is deemed appropriate to get those numbers up with that kind of a goal. Uh, we can certainly look at that. And again, I think their goal of 10 percent of and, and I, you know, I don't know if they're breaking it down by specific uh, uh, zones, cities, zip codes as much as, you know, they, and I, I'm going by what they said on our call. I think it was uh, Friday that they wanted to have Thursday or Friday, 10% of the total population 
was their goal uh, that you know that somebody asked that question and they've done about 4,000 tests so they would have to ramp up to do 12,000 tests over the next 60 days if they wanted to achieve that you know by the end of July or 60 well a little more than that but so okay. But another um, thing that I want to interject here on that testing, and that's about uh, whether uh, they don't necessarily have to live in Edwardsville, but they work here. Right. Uh, there right. has been some conversation early on about, uh, and and we got them to to kind of uh, agree to allow uh, people that that work in the area to get tested as well. So you may not be testing all Edwardsville people when you're testing. Yeah, and, and that's why I was thinking uh, 435 in Woodland would be a good place for some signage. And just just for reference, so when a test is conducted, uh, the the results of the test follow the person's address. So if somebody were tested in Edwardsville and they you know at a test site but they were found positive and they lived in baser then their results are going to be shown as i understand it then they're going to be shown as that, that was my understanding as well in leavenworth yeah. county yeah yeah so. well and and but i'm i'm just thinking from yeah. a public service standpoint sure that, you know we've, we've got a lot of people coming in there and if, if the goal is to really get your arms around this and to move forward and have accurate statistics, I think uh, it would be appropriate for us to promote that as much as possible to get life uh, moving forward as rapidly as possible. So uh, also, on uh, when are we going out for bid on trash and recycling? Uh, I don't, Zach, do you have a better, I, I mean, uh, we, we have to do it here pretty quick, so. Uh, I, I don't yeah, know. If, no, we have a specific it, at it yet. It'll probably be middle of the summer, and we we've been throughout this year and and towards the end of last year, we've been doing a lot of data collection as far as who's on our. I mean, just making sure we've got an accurate address count, uh, so we can better inform the RFP when it goes out. But I believe if I'm, if, 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 if the original. Um, the, the current deal predates me by a little bit, but I believe we awarded that contract in July, or uh, excuse me, in August. And it kind of, it, it coincided with budget adoption at that time, um, but it'll be towards the, the middle or later in the summer. I, I would just add that, I, that our intention is to set up uh, that bid such that there's almost a, a, a matrix. So for example, um, y you know, right now we have, you know, all our contract covers is weekly residential uh, garbage pickup and weekly recycling. So there, there, there's no inclusion in it for commercial services. Uh, there's no inclusion for yard waste or some other services that may be may be in in you know that that people may or may not want so i i think our intention is to try to set it up to where for decision making purposes uh and, and it really gets down to rates and service levels you know does it make more sense as an example to uh you know it, it doing recycling every other week and garbage every week is a better as a better service level for the cost basis, then maybe that's what we do. Is pulling in commercial service, uh, you know, uh, gives us the overall better purchasing power than just residential. Then, you know, we can look at those versus just going out to bid and saying, okay, we've decided this is the service level, give us a bid. So really there, they may be bidding multiple packages if that's the best way to put it versus just bidding exactly what we have today so i, I, many, I think to look at options as we uh you know a, as we look at solid waste we should look at options because it's a it is a changing market and it's one of the reasons quite honestly not to get into 
20 year contracts. I mean, you would think it's right. simple. It's always the same, but really it hasn't been. As we know, during this contract period, there was like the Chinese plastic problem and we want more money. And, you know, I mean, uh, so it, it is in my years, it's it, while it's, you know, there's a certain amount that stays the same, other things change or what happens is the landfill, you know, the Johnson County landfill, I mean, how much life is left? I don't know. It, you know, one year it, it's down to 18 months and then all of a sudden it's got 10 years in it. And, and you know, there's been discussions about no, no yard waste in there. What about bulky items? You know, do we keep doing bulky the way we do it or do we change that? So I, I, I think we look at options in the bid process. How many entities would we anticipate responding? Uh, you probably have three, <laughs> in, okay. unless there's some startups out there. There okay. may be small companies out there, but I mean, when you you know you, you, when you look at the large ones, which is not unusual, uh, you know they've consolidated their services. But even if it's one, I think it's a matter of you know what service levels do we want for our dollars you know mm -hmm. for the dollar uh that that's really gets down to 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 what it is but there's you know uh there's there's you know we have one i mean kc disposals kind of a which is you know located in edwardsville now is you know a fairly recent startup company uh you know a few years old uh okay well, they, they may they may you know, they may want to be very, you know, aggressive because they're located here, even though they're all going to the same, you know, right. All pretty they're much the same, the same landfill. And end of the day, he who controls the landfill controls the pricing in reality. Right. Um, a, a couple of broad comments, and then I would like to get a little deeper into um, this restart y WICO plan. Um, one thing that is, well, first of all, it's highly disappointing from a number of standpoints. One is there's no specificity to it at all. It is so ambiguous and there's no measure to it whatsoever. It appears to be at the whim of one person on, on how it goes and which way it trends. And, um, and so what, what's after green? I mean, green's only 50 groups of 50. What? There's no definition to post green. Or is 50 the largest group we'll ever have in one, one place again? I, you know, I don't know that I have the answer to that question other than <clears throat> I assume after green, it's, it's normal, whatever normal is. But I, well, I, that's the best answer I could give you. I, I don't know. I've not heard. Yeah. There's not been any discussions about post green, really, or even that's the plan. That's disappointing just to hear that. Um, and so specificity, I want to talk about some specifics. There are 28 members on the Restart WICO committee. And in reality, there is one that represents any real interest in Edwardsville, and that would be uh, Superintendent Bungard. Or Brungard. The um, David Pierce, uh, his business is located in uh, Bonner Springs, and um, I'm not sure exactly about Reverend Dr. Dietar Newbert uh, because I know she, I think she practices in in um, in, in Leavenworth County and at Mercy Truth and Safety. Net clinics are in KCK and Shawnee. So I'm not sure why we're tagged there. And um, and it is disappointing that it's lumped together Bonner Springs and Edwardsville because we are two unique entities with unique populations, unique business models, and a unique situation. And just one of those, to give you an example, in KCK, there's 1,200 just to pinch under 1,200 people per square mile in KCK. In Bonner Springs and Edwardsville, there's just under 500 people per square mile. Why do the same rules apply to a dense population as opposed to a more sparse population? And 
So we had no representation in there other than Dr. Uh, Dr. I think it's Dr. Bumgart. Uh, right to, yeah, yes. yeah. And so there's, there's no representation there whatsoever. And I understand that that there was uh, you know an, an attempt, but um, but but no real no real scoring on that type of thing. There's a couple of things I noticed too. There were no first responders in this committee, which was interesting. That the the people who are going to be dealing with it on the front end, there's no representation on the committee whatsoever. Very very disappointing. There is, um, what did I count? I think there's six or eight unified government representatives on that committee and no government representatives from Edwardsville or Bonner Springs. And uh, the, there is no representation by our, our, um, our Chamber of Commerce. And uh, let's see, what else? There's, so we have no elected officials, no employees that had any input into this at all. And I surely hope this is not an indication of 7th and Ann's attitude towards Edwardsville and Bonner Springs. We are part of the unified government and we should have representation in these matters. This is, and as you can tell, I'm really irritated with the whole thing. We send 21.58% of our mill levies to the county of, of every homeowner in, in Edwardsville since 21.58% of their mill levy to 7th and Ann. And we deserve much better representation than what we've gotten in this. And so I, I, I'm glad this is recorded. I hope somebody from Kansas City, Kansas, from Unified Government listens to this. I doubt it. But if they do, they need to know that we are extremely irritated and disappointed on this end of the county that we have been snubbed to this level. <coughs> and so um, I would like to make a proposal that we write in an ordinance or a resolution or some kind of a document that we want on, on this committee, we want appointed immediately one mayor from Bonner Springs and Edwardsville. I don't know if we can include Bonner Springs, but it needs to happen. And one other elected official. And the city manager and an employee appointee from that city manager. I don't know how we go about doing that to let our wishes be known if I need to put that in a form of a motion um, in order to but accomplish. I would not necessarily support a, a motion. I, I think uh, I think to for uh, Mike maybe to craft a letter that would be signed by me um, to to express our our displeasure. Uh, I would hesitate to go into any really hard uh, you know what's I, I can't come up the right word but anyway uh, I understand your displeasure I don't disagree with you but I, I think I, I do not I do not agree with with going after them so to speak in a situation where uh, at this point it's almost over well, so we would like so we would demand, like to think so. Demand that that we have representation uh, at this point would be uh, maybe not the not the best way to to handle it. Well, my concern is we are we are setting precedent for the future. Oh no, I, I don't disagree with you, Chuck. I would just it's just that uh, at this point to 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 demand that that something be changed to a committee that been working for the last couple of weeks or so I think is uh, a little bit a little bit heavy well that brings up another point um, have they been sending out notices for the public of these committee meetings is this an open meeting uh, it is not an open meeting that I understand would it by law be an open meeting 
I, yeah, to, I cannot answer that. Yeah, I'd probably have to defer to to our city attorney. I I would say, well, I, you know, it, it probably doesn't rise relative to the UG commission to an open meeting because they only have uh, two elected members. Now, whether it Which rises may be the reason that, that there is not an open meeting. So. Well, it, it could be an open meeting if, as an appointed board, uh, I, I guess, is a, is a possibility. I, I think maybe Lisa might address that. I don't know if we have enough of the of the facts. I, I would say this, Mr. Adams, is uh, I'm not sure uh, relative to the Restart WICO committee, so the one that put together the plan. I don't know if that committee itself is still an active committee. There are certainly some subcommittees, I'm, I'm gonna call them that, that have uh, been put together, such as looking at, uh, you know, vulnerable populations or uh, education. So, so how are schools going to restart? That probably are more technical. And in, in other words, you know, how are the schools going to restart? I think there's a number of uh, of groups, you know, uh, superintendents and people from school districts that are engaged in that. Some of the, uh, you know, homeless coalitions and and some of those about populations where. They don't have a home, so what happens if, you know, if they get ill? How do you quarantine some of those? So, and I'm not saying that that committee is not still active. I've, I've, I've not heard in recent time. I mean, they put together the plan, which I, I again, I think it's important. So they put together the plan. Ultimately, it's the, the public health, the board of public health, which. In Kansas, basically the county commissioners are in fact the Board of Public Health and they select a chief medical officer or, or the local health officers we often hear, uh, which in our cases is Dr. Greiner. So um, I, I, there's some separation there and I, and I know it's, it, I don't always understand it either but that the 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 unified government as a, as a unified government commission isn't who adopts or puts out uh, the orders. The orders are signed by the chief medical officer in conjunction with the board of public health. And again, yes, it's a lot of the same people and the same things. So I'm not I'm not trying to uh, lessen it. It just uh, that's kind of you know that's kind of the general gist of how that's put together. Now again, whether those are public, I mean, the board of public health meetings are public, and and they've been there. Uh, I don't know if these working groups would be considered a public meeting in in the sense of other boards. And and I I know uh, uh, Miss Dehan's on, and she may want to uh, might give her an opportunity to make a comment on that piece of it. With regard to coma, I was just trying to find my hands up here, the most recent one. Um, I probably would take a little bit more work on my part of who exactly is on this committee, the purpose. I do know there's pretty long lists of those types of entities that they consider subject to coma and those that are not kind of those hybrid things and, and can certainly take a look and see whether this would fit into any of those categories. I don't know that we would find one specifically for this since this is fairly unique, um, but it might give us a sense of whether they were subject to coma or not. This committee, well, we're, we're looking at the best case scenario, we get out of green into never ever land or whatever is past green. So the but, fastest we're going to get there is six weeks. And so there's going to be a lot of water under the bridge in six weeks. And right. for, for the western half of our county not to be represented on this committee is appalling. 
And um, and so I, I am not satisfied with the answer. Um, if we are sending a letter up there, if the, if the council would agree to do so, I think it should be signed by the mayor and the council. To know that it is a, to, to use a worn out word, unified disagreement with, uh, with the way this was handled. If I, I might just add, uh, I was just looking at the plan. So after green is stage five, and it's open, that, that's how it's classified. So it goes stay at home, which we've now moved out of into stage two, which is red zone. Stage three is yellow, stage four is green, and stage five is open. And and you're correct, The they, the, and it is a little different from the state plan in that, uh, and I think there's some, I'm gonna say controversy around whether we have to stay in each zone a minimum of 14 days or not because it's at least the wine the the restart plan as i understand it is supposed to be based on this matrix uh you know going forward so they're looking at 14 days of data and so I think that's where some of the discussions have come around. Well, you can't go to the next zone until you've had 14 days in the red zone. But I, I, I don't, I, I know that there's been some questions about that. I don't know that there's any specific dates, unlike the state plan, at least the way it's set up in the current zone or the current time is, Theirs absolutely says not sooner than and then have a date. So it could be longer than but not lesser than. But but certainly this part up up is problematic. Yeah, when I think of matrix, I think of numbers. And it's mm -hmm. it's like what percentage, how many, when how do you measure? There's no measurement to when we attain anything. And it's basically what you're telling me is it's up to one person's whim on whether they think it's appropriate to do it or not. And, and uh, I, I think there's so many constitutional issues that, that are involved with this. This is um, the precedent. In fact, there was a comment, this is an exact quote by the CEO and mayor is, this needs to be taken seriously, speaking of the COVID just as the flu needs to be taken seriously. That scares the hell out of me. Because he's saying that in the future, flu can be treated like this as well. It did just, the precedent we're setting and the, the language we are using in this period of time is just appalling. And that's not being represented in our, in our county is appalling as well. That's, that is all I have. Just to go back, Mr. Adams, to your to I, I think your suggestion and and I don't know if it's the form of a motion. Uh, and so what I'll need, uh, whatever that you know, maybe you want to listen hear from the rest of the representatives, but I am certainly happy to prepare, uh, 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 you know, a letter I, 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 that probably works. I, the letter format probably, I think, would be the preferred method uh, versus a, a potentially a resolution. Uh, I think we can probably, uh, you know, voice the points better maybe in a letter, uh, but I'll do whatever. Uh, but I am happy to prepare that and have it signed however the body wishes it to be prepared. So just, I know that was uh, kind of your your ending comments. And, and again, I don't know if you would like to hear from the remaining members and then uh, circle back. Well, to we, we will, we will hear from the remaining members as they come rather than jump in on, on uh, Councilman Adams' comments. Um, uh, I, I really good. don't think we need to get into that kind of a discussion at the ending of a meeting. Um, what I might suggest then is uh, that, Mike, that you and I get together to 
tomorrow or sometime and uh, kind of go over this and, and see what kind of ideas we can throw around about, you know, expressing our our opinions, you might say. Yes, sir. And my point about the other council members was not necessarily to jump in on this, but as each of the yeah. other council members come forward tonight with comments, if there's any comments on this topic matter, you know, we can gather. Okay. Sure. That we need to come back at the end just to see if there's, mm -hmm. I'm happy to, to, to carry it forward, you know, again, as the body, uh, you know, as the body determines. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Yes, sir. Um, uh, Chuck, did, 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 did you did you understand my 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 uh, comments regarding the the method uh, of communication? Yeah, Mike and I get together and, and kind of come up with some kind of a idea of how we're going to make our our feelings known without. Uh, It's not a matter of stirring the water as much as it, as it is. Um, as I said, you know, this has gone on for a few weeks now, and to to jump in and and demand something uh, might be a little bit out of place. But uh, Mike and I can surely uh, surely come up with something that that might be uh, amenable to the council. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, right, uh, Carolyn. Hey guys, um, I, I touched on the restart committee a little bit last week. I um, agree with Councilman Adams. I would be happy to sign the letter. In fact, um, this wouldn't hopefully be the first time Mayor Alvey's heard of a request for us to be on the committee. I emailed him two weeks ago, um, two weeks and a couple of days ago, uh, with my um, thoughts on being completely left out of that voice and that representation. I've yet to hear anything back from that email. Um, I feel that as much uh, as they think of our city is, is represented equally in the number of people we have on their committee, and it's pretty discouraging. Um, so yeah, I, I would support that letter of movement in that way. Um, I think since COVID-19, it, it continues to affect our city and we don't have much of a voice at the county level and the county is making decisions for our city. Um, I would like to make a motion or consider uh, scheduling a special meeting for next Monday. I was hoping to have a little more discussion uh, tonight but um, if we could do a special meeting next Monday directly related to COVID-19, our city response and our representation in the county, I, I think that is probably a meeting's worth of just diving into and having a discussion on um, what our city response can be. Um, and in that same thought, some cities choose to prohibit the use of municipal funds for the enforcement of specific federal laws and I was wondering if our attorney could look into how we as a city can use this or other means to draft a resolution promoting more autonomy for Edwardsville. Um, again, since we are quite different than our neighboring cities, I think we should be discussing what we can do for our city and for our citizens to um, protect them and get them back to making their own decisions for their health and their livelihood. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump in again. Carolyn, uh, my feeling is if we're going to do this, we don't want to wait till next Monday. Okay. When do so, you think uh, it would be? That's why I say Mike and I need to talk it out and, and come up with a plan and then present it to the to the council so that we can move forward a lot quicker than than waiting another week. That's just okay. my and, um, Go ahead. I see. I was just going to say um, specifically uh, not just the letter to the county, but also what we can do as a city um, separate from the county. And so if we had a, a special meeting sooner than next Monday, I think that would be fine. I think any letter to the county absolutely needs to come sooner than next Monday, um, but I would like to 
meet, whether it's next Monday or sooner, to discuss what we can do as a city. May I ask just for relative to clarity for a special for the special meeting? I mean, holding a special meeting is certainly the purview of the council, but just uh, yeah, what are what are the legal? Um, yeah, yeah. No, I just need to know. So when you say what the city can do, I just I want to make sure that if we, you know, in order to do a special meeting, there are some some just statutory guidelines we have to follow. Uh, you know, special meetings have to be uh, relatively specific. I mean, you know, I, I mean, it can be on COVID-19, but if there's specific pieces in there that we need to make sure. So I just I want to make sure that. Uh, if we have a meeting, you know, that we include what we need to include so I don't leave something out uh, or, you know, working with Lisa on drafting the right, you know, call the call for the meeting. So is there specific items that you would, when you when you say what the city can do, are you talking about uh, economic items we could do for, for our businesses and cities? Is it, uh, uh, what ability do we have to uh, maybe pursue state or federal funding? I mean, is it more update information? I just want to make sure I'm covering what you're thinking in, in this sense. So, sure. Um, I, I think I specifically what I'm talking about is as it relates to COVID-19 in starting to allow our city, since we're not in the condensed population of Kansas City, Kansas, let our um, businesses um, start deciding for themselves how to move forward in opening, protecting themselves, their employees and their customers, um, letting our churches start to decide when and how they want to move forward. And then our our people and our citizens and our in our personal lives start to decide um, make decisions for themselves. I think that ultimately, and I'm not an attorney on this, but um, the sooner we let people start making their own decisions for their own livelihood um, might avoid um, potential issues um, that are coming up in other city and county governments um, to let them take responsibility for themselves. Now, if we can do anything that helps financially in the future, then that's that's fine, but this specifically, I think, is more along the lines of um, making decisions separate from the county level. Um, another thing I was going to ask about, and um, I, I guess now would be a good time, is even seeing if we need a more specific opinion um, from a, a different health official that would be looking at our city um, as opposed to a whole county, since our again our population is much different. Okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna summarize it and tell me if I'm I'm wrong. But uh, so what I what I think I'm hearing is that a discussion, and, and I'm gonna put it broadly, it, you know, to have a city plan that uh, in I don't know in lieu of, but or in addition to uh, the the current county plan. So is there? So can we have a plan that differs from the the the, the current adopted plan? I, I think is one of your questions. And then the second one, I think what you're referring to is, uh, can a city have, uh, what's the city's authority to have its own local health officer? And how does that, how does that interact with uh, the, the the county and state health officers is that is that fair summary yeah yeah along those lines and okay. just just to clarify a little bit um i'm not so much looking for just a definition of what we we can't do or the state statutes but what can we do so when we look at other cities that make decisions for themselves apart from their state or federal because we see that in several examples around the nation um what can we use as an example from them in our own city to say, okay, what can we do to um, give our citizens uh, the benefit of living in our city, which isn't in such a dense population, and start trusting them to make decisions for themselves instead of assuming that we um, know better than them what's good for them in their own lives. 
Okay. I, I, I think I've got, I, I understand. Thank you. Um, uh, another, another comment that I think I need to make here too, and, and that is to get advice from our attorney about where are, where are we legally bound in this process that we're discussing right now? Can we or can't we, um, you know, disregard or make, uh, make uh, decisions based on uh, something other than the county medical officer? I certainly do not support uh, our city trying to create another department and have a city medical officer. Uh, I think you're really stretching stuff out here. But anyway, um, there again, uh, Mike, you and I really need to, to discuss this and maybe with Lisa and to see where where we can go legally without, you know, getting ourselves in, into some hot water that we don't need to get into. Correct. I just was trying to make sure I, I fully understand the, the scope of, of potential discussions. I mean... There's nothing wrong with discussions, so I just want to make sure, sure I, I understand what the scope is so we can have, uh, you know, I, I don't think tonight is, the, you know, we're going to make a, make a decision of whether we should do A or B or C is better than F, or, but, but rather just knowing what the scope of, if we're going to hold a special meeting, then, you know, what, what does it require to hold a special meeting, and, and, and we can get into all that, uh, you know after this uh and, and then how do we structure it such that we can have the appropriate discussions and conversations that are being requested that that's all i'm trying yeah. to make uh -huh. no i i understand yeah thank you yeah and my goal my goal wasn't to put lisa on the spot tonight okay. um in trying to to make those decisions that's why i was hoping to schedule a separate time um, so we could really look through what our options are. And I, I also believe that we might be putting ourselves in the legal liability when we continue um, down potentially an unreasonable path in keeping people from work and church. Um, and so I think it's worth looking at that side of it as well as, as those lawsuits are continuing to come up around the nation. Um, and if we really want to be included in that part of it. Um, the other thing completely separate, um, and Mike, if, if you touch on that later in, in making sure we get a meeting or whatever we need done scheduled, is um, the just an update on the cemetery. I wanted to point out that a week ago from Saturday that Mike and the Edwardsville Fire Department spent their day up working at the cemetery, um, burning up the brush pile and um, just doing some maintenance around there. And I really appreciate that. Um, we have city staff that um especially our fire department again and again go out of their way and do um above the above what most fire departments do and so i just wanted to point that out and say we really appreciate that um and i was wondering mike if you could just give us an update you said before that um we were talking to you i think it was white about having the rest of the leaves removed before Memorial Day along that fence line in the back. Um, did we ever hear back from them and is that going to be done soon? Uh, well, uh, let me add a little bit and then I'll let Zach jump in because he's had a little more discussions with 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 uh, uh, with Whites, but uh, I can't really take credit for being at the cemetery to get the, the brush burned. Uh, I just tried to help get that organized, which was I, I went up there and spent some time uh, with two members of the public work staff uh, to try to outline a plan to address some of the issues that uh, some that we knew were there, and quite honestly, some we we uh, you know we we weren't aware of or, or weren't uh, you know didn't uh, focus on them enough, and so really went up there to get a plan in place to you know to get that brush burned. I mean, ultimately, I would like us not to be burning brush at all at the cemetery if we need to take it to a different place. We know there's some dead trees up there. We're getting bids on that. There's some tree stumps. And some of these things have been there, uh, you, you know, have been issues for a while uh, that were really before the city became as actively involved in maintenance. And so uh, we were up there, uh, again, I've had, I've had somebody in the cemetery at least one day a week over the last several weeks uh, doing some level of 
of maintenance. Uh, and so they're, <laughs> hate to use the word, but they're chipping away, chipping away at it and, and trying to get that done. Uh, you know, we brought topsoil in. I'm not sure, you know, we've ever brought topsoil in by, by the truckload, but uh, made arrangements to get that up there. So when we're filling graves, you know, we don't have to go run to the store and try to pick up three or four bags of topsoil. We have some, some there. There's some other soil that's there as well um, and get things seeded. Um, it gets harder when we get into the summer months to try to get grass to grow, but really just trying to, to get those with a focus and, and and that's where I'll transition it over here to Zach in just a second. You know, I know that the EPS board uh, is going to meet remotely or, you know, meet uh, this week and make sure that we've got what we need to do to, you know, make it for Memorial Day weekend. And I, that's kind of our target right now is to try to address a lot of these maintenance, what I call maintenance, kind of the you know, get the leaves raked up, whether not not just along the fence line, but under the bushes, been cleaned out, pruning the bushes, cleaning up the the, the entry points. Uh, you know, more than just mowing the cemetery. Uh, you know, mowing and edging it, it is you know some of those extra uh, levels that need uh, special attention. So that's what we've been working on. That's what we're going to continue to work on. And then I'll let Zach pipe in on his discussions with uh, White's landscaping and, and what the plan is for them and the leaf removal in addition to their normal maintenance. So I see Zach's online here. Yeah, White's will be out before the end of the week taking care of the fence, uh, the, the leaf buildup along the east fence line. Um, that, that I believe last year they had um, two to three folks out for um, five hours, if I were to look at the, the invoice from this time last year, uh, getting that picked up. And we're also going to be working to get um, the, uh, the southern portion of the, the the leaf accumulation, where a lot of that ends up, uh, that picked up as well, as well as the, uh, it's not it's not terrible, but there is some accumulation along the ditch uh, between the cemetery and 104th Street. Um, so all the leaf pickup is scheduled to, to happen this week what's going to be happening at the cpps board one of the items on their agenda will be uh, essentially just giving them a comprehensive update of what staff has been doing uh, over the last couple of weeks now that you know, we were uh, able to get a staffing model put together specifically for the cemetery and then to uh it, it this for this first meeting our, our priority is to make sure that we've got all the needs addressed in time for uh, having the site look as good as it can be for Memorial Day. Um, we've got some community members who have offered some uh, assistance and guidance related to the vegetation that's already out there. And uh, our current, our Mike Odell, our public works maintenance worker is doing a great job um, working with the community members, making sure he's being mindful of things that are out there. But um, yeah, to answer your question, the leaf pickup was scheduled for to be completed by the end of this week. And uh, yeah, we're going to be asking the CPPS board if they've got specific items of concern uh, that, that we're going to need to get addressed prior to Memorial Day. Now, more of a long-term look um, for our June meeting for the CPPS board. What I'm currently planning is hopefully we are in a position where we can, you know, it, it, it gather safely. It's a rather large board, but we have a meeting out at the cemetery to kind of you know, now that we've got the short-term stuff out of the way and Memorial Day was, uh, uh, we were able to, to do some work specifically related to that event. You know, what's in the long-term, what's going to be the long-term maintenance of the of the site? Um, trying to get a schedule of everything that's out there, everything that, that we want to keep out there, everything that, you know, we might want to pull back on and maybe offer for more community involvement as far as, you know, renting planters or volunteer things of that nature. I mean, the general maintenance items, the edging, the mowing, that's going to be city staff and contract work. But um, what we want to get put together is a kind of a long-term maintenance plan where as staffing changes and as the makeup of that board changes, you know, whoever's the, per the people doing the work and reviewing the site, we've at least got a framework to look at as, you know, here at our base level of of maintenance for the site. And that's, that also applies to... You know, right now the cemetery doesn't really have a lot of um, 
easy to impart policies to the to the families who buy plots out there. So there's not a lot of clear guidance of you know how long can a, and a you know a, a a lantern be out there or you know plastic flowers or something like that. I know that's led to some some hurt feelings whenever the cemetery board has taken it upon itself to go out and perform some of that cleanup. And some of that has just been a lack of clarity on what's been allowed and you know what are the policies around some of those items. So that's you know that that's a, a summer project for the CPS board to, to firm up and to get workable policies that we can you know if you're a family coming in and you want to schedule a, a, a funeral service or buy a plot we're able to give you here's a list of you know here's when we do our cleanup here's what's allowed here's how long they're allowed for um and really just get a that way it's very clear and very easily uh referenced both for staff and the board and members of the public and I just add, I, I think Zach made a really good point is that so we have to have a, you know, call plan a system in place, whatever, that isn't dependent upon an individual person or an, in, you know, a board specific person. Because, you know, for example, uh, I mean, we know, you know, we're going to have an employee gone for an entire week on vacation. Well, if that's the only employee that knows what needs to be done, we can't just not do stuff for a week because one person's on vacation. And so that that's really the, the policy pieces that Zach and the board are really going to work on. So, you know, I think we've said this before, it, you know, if there's a landscaping plan, for example, where a flower is going to be allowed, not allowed, uh, you know, uh, what types, et cetera, then it's fairly easy to keep it maintained when we know what the, you know, the broad board wants. I mean, that's that part of the purpose of having a policy board is to help set those standards, uh, you know, and then in, and prioritize work. Uh, I mean, the technical pieces of going out and having a tree removed or, you know, mowing a certain part of the cemetery once every two weeks or, you know, having the trash cans, you know, uh, put out on the curb on a certain day or any of those kind of things are, are, are relatively easy to put in place into a schedule. Uh, but we just, you know, we need that all together and, and again, not be dependent upon, uh, you know, expecting one person or, you know, to take care of stuff because people, you know, are come and go. And, uh, and so we just, we just want to make sure we're doing the right things at the right time and, and move forward. And again, I think, uh, you know, once we, you know, kind of got into starting to, to work in the cemetery here this spring, I mean, they, they've made quite a bit of progress. Again, I've been up there several times uh, since we, we haven't had a public works director and working with the guys and coming up with, you know, ideas and plans and trying to get, you know, trying to treat it somewhat like we would use, uh, you know, how we, how would we take care of our, our front yards or backyards or, you know, areas that, that we would want to maintain. And so that's, that's kind of what we've been doing. So that's probably more, more of an answer than you wanted, but, uh, but we've been working hard on trying to, and some of it is, is you know, is picking, you know, it has been stuff that hasn't been touched in a while and needs to be, needs to be addressed. And so we're working hard at it. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, yeah, I'll look forward to coming through hopefully next Saturday and because um, it sounds like the, so the leaves should be all gone by, by the next weekend. Is that, am I following that right? Yep, that is, that is that, yeah. That's the intention. We we do know that they're perfect. Rain. Thanks for. So we're you know we we may be working around rain. So uh, uh, you know I and I would note and I think Zach noted it and I'm not saying that it got 100 percent, but there was leaf removal last year and a couple of you know I know we had a, a Boy Scout group up there and they got some of it uh, you know as a volunteer group and then again whites did a portion of it uh though there's there's certainly areas along that fence line that probably you know haven't been touched in a while that need to get touched not just leaves but uh 
quite honestly, we, we got to come up with a way to clear out that fence line. I think it's an entirety uh, to, to keep things from growing into it. And I mean, if we're going to have a fence through there, we, we need to probably get on the neighbor's property and, and clean up on the other side of the fence. But we've got to get permissions to do that. So uh, lots of ideas and, and trying to implement those that uh, we can in, in phases. That's all I've got for tonight. Mike, I'll just wait to hear back from you um, maybe at the end of the meeting about a special meeting and getting that set if possible on okay. day or sooner. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, Garrett? Did I miss a date on the, uh, the pop-up COVID test? Did I miss a date on that? We, we have not set a date for Edwardsville yet. Where you, I spoke to, uh, so Gordon Criswell, who is one of the assistant city manager, or assistant county managers, I, I think from, a, from the county side, him and Terry Garrison, who's the uh, acting director of public health. So I reached out to, to Ms. Garrison and uh, got a call from Gordon about uh, trying to, you know, Number one, what we thought would be a good site within the city, and then uh, trying to schedule around our dates with with their dates. So we're just that will be hopefully maybe by tomorrow or Wednesday we'll be able to have a uh, a date set. Obviously, they have to have uh, they have to have people. You know, they I mean they they bring the public health people out. Uh, which takes you know certain different levels of people to, to come out uh, uh, you know to do that. I know that that they that they actually had a person within the health department that has tested positive, uh, who conducting some of the drive-throughs along with, and so a couple other people have been quarantined. So uh, they've had to ramp up some outside staff to continue doing the the testing protocols. So. Uh, Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I hadn't uh, that I hadn't missed the date yeah, on that. No date, no date's been no date's been. Set, okay, so. is there any cost incurred to Edwardsville on that? Is a question. And then uh, what do you have to be? Re I've got a couple. And then do you have to be referred to that, or is that a self referral, or you know how do you end up going through that? Uh, there's there's no cost to us. Uh, we would probably do like we do with. Uh, what we've been doing to support the school, uh, you know, we would help with setup, takedown, traffic control, those types of things. We're, you know, I mean, using our staff. So no, no cost that we have to pay to them. There's no cost to uh, the individuals getting the test. Uh, I don't believe that those typically require referrals now. I, it, I, we hear on the call that a referral is not necessary, and then we see on TV sometimes that you have to call the health department to get a referral. In my understanding, you don't have to have a a medical referral. Uh, you do have to, uh, you know, again, the, the most yeah, recent. Well, you, you have to prove that you do have some symptoms. They don't want anybody yeah. coming in there just off the street and say, test me. Uh, right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, You're supposed to demonstrate there, to there is protocol that they have on how they determine whether they test you or not, and I'm not clear as to what that is. I don't think they've ever discussed that on the phone conversation. Yes. What the protocol is, uh, you know, the last one was that you you had to have one, and I, I think I said this earlier. You have to have one or more one or yeah. more symptoms within the last 48 hours. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember you saying that. I just so, was so, just curious what the referral was. It sounds like I might go along the lines with what Chuck and, and Carolyn are talking about on this this green initiative, green light, red light, and all that stuff. Anyway, right. that, that's all I've got, so. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, Garrett, uh, Margaret? Uh, yes, um, I'd like to point out and thank Zach again for the, the quarterly budget review. That is extremely helpful and due to what we will possibly be going through in the next few months, it will probably prove to be even more helpful. So thank you again, Zach. I know that's a lot of work. Um, Chief Mathis, 
Did I see an opening in the police department? Did did I thought we were fully staffed, or was I seeing things? Uh, no, we're we are advertising for one opening, and we had we had actually I don't think they overlap, but we had an opening prior to that one that we filled right away, and then we had uh, someone. Uh, in other words, we took an adverse personnel action, so we have an opening due to the someone uh, leaving employment with us, and so we've been advertising. Okay. But so right now we just our, our applicant pool is pretty slim, and uh, we're gonna try to ramp up some of these advertisements that we've done in the past, but it's hard to get people to come in. So we're trying to figure out how we might have some interviews and things like that. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, like to. Once again, thank all the staff for all their hard work in all these trying times and uh, circumstances. The fire department uh, for helping up at the cemetery, among everything else you're helping with. The police department and helping with the courts being held down at the community center. Um, everything everybody's been doing above and beyond. I'm sure each and every one of you has done several things out of their realm several things that are not included in their daily duties, so it um, doesn't go, go unnoticed, and it's certainly appreciated. Um, I am very, very excited for Dustin Zinger, the new public works um, director, so I'm sure Mike and Zach both are too, or whoever else has been helping out with public works, and shout out to Mike in the public works for his help and his care up in the cemetery. Um, very much appreciated this just it's just there's so many things it feels like i know with my work and my family it feels like there's 300 things you have to do every day so um hats off to everybody um and my comment about the uh, unified government not sure I don't, I don't know maybe i'm i'm looking at it as taking a step back and how was our city communicated with as far as do you have anybody would you like to appoint anybody can we have three or four people from your city um, not sure who from unified government reached out and not sure who from unified government they reached out to so maybe taking a step back to get that defined by our city hey here's can we communicate this way in the future can can we do things this way in the future? So I don't know. I kind of sometimes I have to digest things, um, and and would like to. I, I'm very interested in that letter that's going to go to the unified government because I do feel like we should have been included from the get go. But I don't know how that works. How the communication works is very very important. How communication works. And that's all I have. I, I will I will oh, wait ahead, for man. my comments to 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 tell you about that, Margaret. If if you can hold on, okay. Yeah. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And and I will say I I will be glad to 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 uh, have the public works director. I I literally was up with the crews. Uh, uh, well, we helped pull wire so we could get uh, uh, internet connection in the community center, and then uh, we built. Uh, uh, plexiglass shields for the for the judge and prosecutors etc so we uh, uh, I, I got one of the public works guys and we headed to Menards and got the materials and and built a, you know uh, the three of us built up you know eight of them in about two hours so uh, <laughs> I, I, that, that's why I think Mr. Zinger will be be valuable because I think he he also is uh, of that type that you know, we'll get in there and, and, you know, get when those kind of things need to be done, can get in there and get it done. And when, you know, he needs to go over and serve on the committees at Mid-America Regional Council uh, for highway projects, he'll be able to do those kind of things too. So he, uh, he, he has some, another little interesting tidbit about him is he, he actually is a, I think he still is a council member at the small town that he lives in. 
And as I recall the story, uh, he got a call the day after the elections and got a congratulations. And he asked what congratulations for what? And they said, you've been elected to the city council. And he said, but I didn't vote for the city council. And they said, well, you still got elected. So uh, <laughs> he actually had a little bit. I don't think that's his calling, but he's actually had a little bit of uh, sitting in your seats as well. So I, 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 I interesting. So uh, we'll, we'll the town's like 80 people or a hundred, couple hundred people. It's a fairly small town. Right. But right. I, I Thank thought you, that was Mike. a funny story, but yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, are you done, Margaret? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. All right, Chuck, it's your turn. Wow. Uh, <laughs> two and a half hours. This, is a, this was a long one. Hey, but a lot of good information was put out there and a lot of things um, that uh, um, some concerns and some questions that I still have. Um, and one thing, Mike, uh, on the notification of folks to get tested, I think, I don't know, does the city have a signed board? A message board, you know, uh, you see them all over, you know, uh, lane ends ahead, uh, merge left. Um, and what I'm talking about is one of the digital sign boards that may be placed uh, at the uh, intersection there at 4th and uh, K32 that would uh, indicate the date that we're going to be having that testing and, and where it's at. Uh, we do not have a sign board. I, I know that the unified government, uh, that they had at one point put out eight different sign boards uh, around the county, uh, mainly I think more around the core of the city area. Uh, I think they ended up leasing for the, I think they had at least four. I don't know if they're still using all of those. We don't have one, but we certainly could have, you know, get one through Traft Tech or one of the, you know, one of those kind of companies. We've done that in the past on road projects where we wanted to make sure we had plenty of advanced advance notice. We could well, I, I think yeah. that uh, I think that we that would be a good thing for, to get. And I, and and before we go out and, and actually spend money on on leasing one or renting one, I would like for us to reach out to our partners, the uh, unified government and see yeah. if during that testing time, if we're able to use a sign, we are still in Wyandotte County and um, and utilize some equipment that they have. So I think that would be a good, I, I remember uh, uh, Councilman Adams asking about how we're going to notify people. And I think that that would be, if we could put that up a week in advance and let them know, you know, testing on this date, this hours and, and we're at, I think that's a good way where people are driving by there every day and they see it. So um, we will, I think we will that's include that request. Okay. And then I think that one of the, uh, I kind of got a kick out of, uh, one of the uh, the four symptoms that uh, to get tested was body aches. Well, if that's one of the symptoms, I think every single morning that I get out of bed, I qualify. So I'm not <laughs> sure that I, I could probably have that test done every day. But uh, the other thing that I'd like to just talk about is the, the letter of approval. Um, I have said, and you guys have heard me say for quite some time, that I feel like our level of representation, and I'm not talking about Bonner, I'm talking about Edwardsville. Um, and, and this goes way back farther than just this, uh, this uh, board that has been formed. And that I don't think that our representation at the unified government level is, is there. Uh, uh, we, we have a commissioner. I'm not beating up on our commissioner. I'm, I'm not saying that at all. We have a, we have a commissioner and we have a um, uh, at large that, that, that should be speaking up for Edwardsville. And I don't know, I don't know that, uh, that I see that. And that is a concern. I agree with Chuck Adams, Carolyn, and everyone else that's voiced their uh, their opinion regarding this that I I feel like we get Edwardsville gets asked 
to participate when we have to not 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 whenever uh they don't they don't look at us as an equal uh, as there's three cities there's one one big city and two little cities that uh kind of tag along and that's how that's how i feel <clears throat> on that now if i remember right mike you had said that they had requested or, or you gave a list of, uh, when they were originally forming this board that there was a list that was given of potential uh, folks to be on that. And if I'm not mistaken, not one of those people were uh, selected. Is that correct? Uh, there were some names given, and I think the mayor probably. Uh, I, I will address that. that. But when, yes, when, there when I, some in my comments. I, I, both you guys were talking at the same time. I couldn't hear anything. I, I, well, what I said, Chuck, was in my comments, I will address that and clear that up one more time. Okay. All right. Um, and the last but not least is the, the cemetery uh, situation. <clears throat> I'm glad to hear that we're making efforts, Matt, to go up there and do uh, get, get that cemetery uh, on the right track. Uh, and I'm not pointing fingers at anyone at all. I will just be glad uh, that that w when we finally get to the point where that cemetery means as much to the city and the council and everyone, and I'm not I, I'm, I know that it means a lot to a lot of different people here that um, that uh, that that we are really dedicated to that cemetery and that we're spending time and we're allocating dollars and making sure that that cemetery is something. As you guys know, some of you guys know that I just lost an uncle just two weeks ago and I was at a cemetery out of town and, and you don't really realize how important a cemetery is until you need, until you go there. I don't have folks that I visit in Edwardsville Cemetery, um, but I can only imagine that the people that do when they go there, they want they want to they want to see a, a a cemetery that they can be proud of and that uh, is clean, nice, and is well represented. So I want to make sure that we continue on the right track on getting that cemetery straightened out. Um, and with that being said, that's all I have to say. Okay, uh, thank everyone. Um, here is here is what happened on the selection of the members of the regrouping, re, re the mayor asked both uh, Mayor Harrington and I if we had individuals. Uh, at the time that we were on the phone, I did not have one, so I contacted Mike, and Mike did some research and got some volunteers. A after uh, he got those volunteers, then I contacted the mayor, Mayor Alvey, that I had names, and um, as you already know, um, he didn't call me back. So it's not that we didn't try to get somebody on that. It's, that's how we were, uh, um, I, I hesitate to use the word, that's how we were treated, but that was how this thing worked out. Um, I have not expressed my displeasure with the mayor over the fact that we did not have a representation. Uh, however, uh, that doesn't mean that I was not uh, pleased with with his uh, handling of it, but uh, that's the way it washed out. So, um, and, and that's why I feel at this stage, you know, to, to go in and try to get somebody from Edwardsville on that committee, it's, I think it's a little bit late. But uh, I will do whatever the council wishes. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and Mayor. That's my comment on that. And uh, I'm going Mayor. to kind of reiterate uh, some comments that everybody else has made. Really appreciate uh, the hard work that everybody is doing right now. It is in, under trying times, and, and I think the city is is well taken care of by Mike and, and our police and fire department and and everyone involved. Um, 
so uh, with that, uh, Mike and I will get together and see what we can come up with. We will get together with Lisa and see what we can come up with to, to uh, make some comments uh, to the unified government over the uh, over the selection of those members of the uh, of the committee. Well, well, Mayor, this is Chuck Sykes. Will so will that be a will will that be a letter or however that form of correspondence will that be something that is going to be approved by the council before it is sent so that we can either um, you know add take away. I, I, I rather than jump in and make any suppositions, I, I fully understand your concern there and. Uh, Mike and I will discuss how we're going to handle that, you know, whether it's by letter or what we're going to do and, and how, uh, how the, the council will uh, authorize or clear, uh, you know, where we're going with it. So yes, uh, it yes, will not sir. be fairly done by me or Mike. So. Yes, sir. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, if there's nothing else to be said, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you very much, and everybody have a wonderful evening. What's left of it? And and, and we will be Mike. Uh, Mike will probably do the the contacting so that we uh, don't get involved with any uh, coma violations. <laughs> yes, anyway, sir. so thank you all for your input. I really appreciate it, and uh, we will get something taken care of. Thank you.